All right. Um, people are still connecting, but I would propose we don't waste more time of, of the lecture. Um, so let us let us start. Um, I'm Ronnie, Ronnie Hench. Um, I'm not part of this lecture. I'm just chairing it and give a little bit of technical support. I work for the German Aerospace Center uh, close to, to Munich in, in Germany. Um, but I'm here because I'm the current chair of the uh, technical committee on, on image analysis and data fusion that is organizing this, this school, as you can see in our lovely logo on this site. Um, today is the second day. Uh, we had a very successful day uh, yesterday with two lectures, right? So two lectures and two times the practical part. Uh, most of you were already there, so I, I can keep this introduction very quick. Um, Today, I'm, I'm very excited that we have a very interesting topic on learning with either few or even worse zero labels. Um, so this is really exciting. It's, it's a really important um, problem that we face in Earth observation and remote sensing where labels are usually scarce, uh, partially very expensive to, to generate. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy that, that we have a, a really good team talking about this today. Um, if you want to ask questions, probably the, uh, the lecturers will tell you a little bit how to interact with them. But in general, you have the options to either um, unmute yourself and ask the question or uh, write the question into the chat box. And then the, the, the speakers can, can address this a little bit later. Um, just, you know, with, with a lot of power becomes a lot of responsibility. So if you unmute yourself, please may also make sure that you mute yourself again when you're not asking a question, right? So it would be nice that everybody is muted, uh, um, apart from the speaker, obviously, just that we can keep the background noise to, to the absolute minimum. All right, and with this, I would like to, to introduce the speakers. So we have a mix of two teams here. Uh, the first one is from Professor Xiaoxiang Xu from the Technical University of Munich, together with uh, Dr. Sudipan Sa, also from the Technical University of Munich, and Dr. Li Xiao Mao um, from, well, both the Technical University of Munich, where he is currently as a guest professor, and also the, the German Aerospace Center, different institute than mine, but the same, uh, the same center. And then the other team is from uh, the um, from the professor Carola Bibane Schönlieb from the University of uh, of Cambridge, um, together with uh, Ange Dr. Angelica Aviles Rivero. Um, and as far as I understood, Angelica will start with the talk, and then there is Lichau, and then there comes Sudipan. So I'm very happy to to have you here. Thank you for for doing this. And I wish you a very exciting and interesting and also interactive uh, session now for the next four hours. And with this, Angelica, um, the floor is yours. Yeah. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you very much for having us today. Uh, this is a pleasure for us having uh, and be part of this amazing consumer school. So today, what we are going to talk about and discuss is about how to push forward algorithmic techniques with fewer labels. So there will be a, a different set of topics during this, uh, during this session. And for the first session, I will talk about semi-supervised learning. So, and we are going to realize about and go to a journey, uh, revisiting, revisiting a classic deep learning and hybrid techniques. How they positioning up to the day, what are the advantages, disadvantage of current algorithmic techniques and potentially uh, take and have some conclusions with what, what is next? So, so how is organizing this talk? This is organizing as follows. First of all, I'm going to give an introduction about a, a, a very big motivation about why in this era of big data, we need to develop more robust and generalizable tools to handle really large amount of data. From there, I will narrow more the topic towards semi-supervised learning. Why is semi-supervised learning? Why is a very perfect fit for handling a huge amount of, of data and what is happening nowadays in this area? From there, we are going to discuss and revisiting classic deep learning techniques and how we can get the best of both worlds, classic techniques and deep learning techniques and fusion it to the so-called hybrid models. For that, we are going to do a case study for a hyperspectral classic classification. Uh, and we are going to take a look about what is done in this area. But then towards the end of this talk, we are going to show that actually the principles of semi-supervised learning can be applied to any downstream task. For example, semantic segmentation. Although I'm not going to go in details to the semantic segmentation, I want to show you 
some initial sneak peek about what are the challenge. Because the principles are the same, but the tasks are different and complex. We are talking about classification and semantic segmentation that is more pixel-wise and video analysis. So what are the difference and complexities we need semi-supervised learning? And then I'm going to close my presentation with the concluding remarks. So I would like to start my presentation with a phrase that we hear everywhere, like a pixel of videos or didn't happen. And this is really true because if we stop for one second to think about the vast amount of data that we generate every single day, it's really mind blowing. Just to give you an example, uh, let's take some numbers from platforms that everyone is very knowledgeable. For instance, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and so on. So if we take uh, as an example, for instance, uh, Facebook, we, we produce more than 50 million of photos per hour. So this is really mind blowing. And it's not only about photos, but also as well about video, text, and a combination of both. And even more complex uh, data that we are able to see every single day. But this is not only happening in social media, that is happening in every single domain. For example, two examples that we are able to see here is remote sensing itself. That's going to be the topic of this talk and this particular session. And also as well, for instance, another example is a medical domain. So with this, okay, we have now the data. And the big question is how we can gain insights into this data. And this is the big question uh, because even if we have the data, if we don't ask questions like how, why, and what, this data doesn't have value. So this data is not going to have value until we extract knowledge and we ask particular questions to, and with the main goal to ace decision or make easier decision to the experts. For instance, uh, we have uh, hyperspectral data, we want to do classification, and for instance, people in uh, forest conservation can make faster decision about, uh, for instance, a particular regions and how it has been evolved, et cetera. So we want to do that and, re and respond to these questions about that. And again, this is not only about hyperspectral, every single type of data has grown exponentially. Like another example is uh, urban level uh, video that you're able to see here as an example. So the question is why we, we need to analyze that. So the, well, here as an example is semantic segmentation. And the main goal is because we want to help policymakers to make better decisions or to be, make uh, better policies in, in terms of health, traffic, and, and urban uh, decisions. So, but we realize that actually this type of data that we have is growing uh, up not only exponentially, but it's very complex in different sense, volume, variety, and high uncertainty. So the main question here will be, we need to develop new algorithmic techniques capable to processing massive amount of data. But not only that, but the algorithmic techniques be able to do it in a robust and accurate fashion. So, and for that, we are going to go and delve into three different uh, classes, family of techniques, let's say the classic perspective where majority of the feeling theory has been developed, as well as recent developments of uh, deep learning techniques. And then we are going to see how actually the principles of classic techniques with the power of deep learning can be merged in, into what is so-called hybrid techniques. What can be done in this area, uh, particularly that can help remote sensing data of this very complex data. So we need this family of techniques, of course, there are different paradigms, for instance, supervised learning, unsupervised, reformed learning, et cetera, a combination, a holistic techniques where it's a combination of different principles. So, but today we are going to focus in a particular paradigm that is called semi-supervised learning. And this one is the, the main topic of this uh, talk, how we are going to navigate in rest and past, present and future, uh, what is next in this area. So what is going to be the main goal of this talk? So the main, the, the main goal of this talk is going to be to draw attention in the power of not only deep learning or hybrid techniques, but all these principles that we know since the classic perspective, deep learning, and until arrived to the new uh, holistic techniques, for instance, uh, reaching hybrid models in semi-supervised learning for remote sensing. For that and fulfill this purpose, we have three main um, points to cover today. The first one is why is interesting semi-supervised learning, how we can do it, and what is it? So we are going to revise uh, semi-supervised learning from a different point of view. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is going to be three main ones, the classic, the deep learning, and the hybrid perspectives. 
And then we are going to talk about uh, what is so called in the community, uh, the quiet revolution of semi-supervised learning. What are the disadvantage, advantage, and what is the landscape of semi-supervised learning? And fact, uh, last but not least, we are going to discuss about a particular case study, for instance, uh, that is image classification. How we can use image classification with semi-supervised learning to develop really robust and accurate uh, solutions. And we are going to take it, I mean, semi-supervised learning, you will see uh, towards the, through this talk that is really huge area. So uh, there are different family of techniques, different subfamilies. So we are going to focus a particular case study on graphical models. And then towards closing this uh, talk or this, part of this first part of the session, we are going to talk about how these principles can be applied to different uh, downstream tasks. For instance, semantic segmentation. So then, as I mentioned before, just uh, to clarify, one of the case studies here for semi-supervisor that we are going to take is image classification. So uh, let's define what is image classification before to go more into details. So the best way to define it is uh, through an illustration. So we have a set of predefined classes, so we have our data, and the main goal is to assign to one or more of these set of predefined classes to your sample. This is image classification, and this is particularly the downstream task or the task that we are going to take as a case study. So, and when we realize and we take a look about the literature, not only hyperspectral, but in general, remote sensing with image classification, we realize that early works or majority works relies on what is called the paradigm supervised techniques. So the main uh, disadvantage of these family of techniques is that you need a good and large corpus of labeled data. And this is really uh, hard, particularly in remote sensing, because uh, unlike, for instance, labeling cats and dogs, when you are labeling uh, remote sensing data, you need some expert knowledge about, for instance, if it's, if it's vegetation, et cetera. So this is like a constraint. And the question about, okay, the labels is, is a constraint itself. Even if you have labels, you have high uncertainty. So what about learning with no labels or fewer labels? That has been the question. But this question is not new. This question, we have seen it in the machine learning literature, in the psychology literature for several years now. For instance, in Buckler in 1989, uh, they, they propose what, uh, something that is as follows. Uh, what use can the brain make of the massive flow of the sensor information that occurs without any associated rewards or punishment? So this is, was a question regarding about towards learning with no labels, uh, what we know now about unsupervised and any family of techniques that are on there. Of course, uh, the complexity in unsupervised learning in comparison with the performance to semi-supervised are semi-supervised is still, there is uh, uh, not at the same pair. And the, main, and the main reason is because you don't have any prior knowledge there. So you need to have new algorithmic techniques and that are, are not going to go into details, but towards this talk, we are going to talk about, for instance, how, what are the new and next uh, terminal techniques that have been using, like for instance, self-supervised. But uh, this, this kind of question about learning with fewer or no labels has been in the community for a while. And, but particularly in this talk, we are not going to talk about no labels because this is a lecture itself, but we are going to talk about fewer labels and particularly about semi-supervised learning. So why is so interesting about semi-supervised learning? As I mentioned before, labeling, the main question is, and the main point is that labeling is hard to obtain. So, and this is not only hard to obtain, but also as well require expert knowledge. And even if we have experts, sometimes we need to advocate to have two readers or more to decrease the inherent human bias in the labeling. So of course that's in inherent to be expensive and time consuming. And we have to deal in the algorithmic techniques with the uh, inherent human bias that that is going to be propagating in the error of the algorithmic techniques. So this is a motivation of how semi-supervised learning is interesting, particularly when we are handling huge amount of unlabeled data. So, why is interesting at this point in time? Semi-supervised learning is nothing new, has been in the community since early developments, since uh, underpinning developments in the theoretical side, in the applied side, and so on. So what is happening now is something that we are going to see here. In the past, uh, it was, let, let me put a cursor here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, in the past, what, what, we, what was the belief in the research community is that if you want performance, 
what you need to do is to have more labels. So, and this is what it was the go-to uh, paradigm. I, I need performance, so I need to make sure that I have enough labels. And it went, if I want to work in semi-supervised learning, then uh, I know the performance is going to be, there will be a gap in performance here. So what is happening now is what in the community is known as the quiet semi-supervised revolution. So, and with the new developments, uh, what we are able to see is an effect that we have here. We, we know that with semi-supervised learning works on the assumption that you have less labels, but the performance is actually comparable or better than semi-supervised learning. And this is something that it has been interesting more and more in the community to try real world applications beyond uh, only theoretical underpinning. So, and, but what is semi-supervised learning? How many taxonomies we have there? And when we realize, uh, I, will, I would like to have the distinction on main, three main two, uh, big categories. That is model-based or uh, energy models, what uh, has been known in the community for a while. So, and this is mainly, again, for the case of classification. There is a, for a, any downstream task, there are different uh, literature, but again, this case study, we are going to focus on classic image classification or hyperspectral, any remote sensing uh, classification. So then we have deep learning techniques and deep learning techniques, we are able to see that they come uh, early developments in 2017. And from there, uh, different developments up to the date has been uh, presented in the community. So what we realized the community, like, like the commonality here is that the same supervisory principles are there, are, are shared in the, commun in the commonality. It's something that we are going to see in that following slide. What, what are the pillars of semi-supervised learning and both principles of all the pillars that we know in semi-supervised learning, either if it's model-based, deep learning-based, they are running under the same assumptions. And the, the interesting part is that here we are going to see to have some disadvantage that we are going to discuss later. But uh, one thing that has been very interesting is the huge improvement in, in performance that we see here from model-based to deep learning based techniques. And, uh, but there's still there are advantage and disadvantage of both that we are going to discuss in a few. And another set of techniques that we are going to discuss as well is hybrid models. What about to have the best of both worlds? What about to have some explicit constraints in a model base? With explicit constraints, I mean, we can have like uh, some explicit mathematical modeling in your logs or your functional, and then to know exactly what is happening in each process. Or even you can guarantee some, uh, some properties, like for instance, some convergence analysis of your algorithm technique, et cetera. But at the same time, to, to keep the uh, astonishing performance of deep learning. And this is where we are going to have as a last part, uh, hybrid models. Again, this is a big, uh, taxonomy, there are, we need each of these, there are different um, uh, separation or subcategories because all of them you can do it very, again in, in different terms, for instance, generative models, proxy-based techniques, graph-based techniques, or perhaps in deep learning, what is the most uh, popular one is what is so-called perturbation-based techniques or enforcing this consistency regularization in the algorithm technique. So uh, go through all of that, we are going to go and investigate it uh, in a very uh, general point of view, but we're going to focus in a particular family of techniques that is graph-based graph techniques. Because every, every single family of techniques is a huge uh, world. So everyone will deserve a lecture itself. So we are going to start going into more and delving into more details. So as I mentioned before, semi-supervised learning, even if you have classic techniques, deep learning techniques, there what is, no, uh, what is uh, well known in the community, like the pillars of semi-supervised learning. So any semi-supervised techniques works under certain assumptions. And this one is relying on the uh, distribution of the data. So what we have as a pillars of semi-supervised learning first is the smoothness assumption. Then we have the clustering assumption, the low density separation. Well, here I will, I will have the distinction, for instance, clustering assumption uh, and the low separability assumption has been known in the community as equivalent somehow. So closing an assumption, what is telling you is actually, if you have uh, your samples that are very close to each other, they are likely to belong to the same class. Why is low density separation to say, you want to have or enforce your class algorithm technique to have this boundary separation when in regions where you have fewer points. And then you have the manifold assumption. And when you're saying about the manifold assumption is that 
even if you have high dimensional data, you, you are going to find um, uh, a manifold that uh, all your data will, will become low di dimensionality in, in a low dimensional space. So, and now we are going to talk about different, uh, the three main divisions of same supervised learning, energy-based, deep learning-based, and hybrid models. So in the past or in the classic perspective, what we know is something like this. We have our data or set of predefined classes, and we have, okay, we assume we have a preprocessing in the data, and then we have a functional here in the classic perspective. So this is a, a functional or explicit mathematical a model where what you can see here or in the, for the classification part is that you want to assign um, one or fewer labels from the set of predefined classes to your sample. And this is what is happening is that what you have that in, in the classic perspective is that what is the probability, the highest probability that your current sample belongs to the set of predefined classes? So you can see it as a having for the current sample that you're analyzing, uh, you're going to have for each of the set of predefined classes, which probability are belonging. And the final class for this particular sample that you have will, will be assigned based on which one had the highest probability. And this is what is happening in the classic perspective. What we are able to see is that similar uh, behavior can be seen from the deep learning perspective. Uh, we have the data sets, we have a set of predefined classes here, we have a preprocessing, but now you don't have this explicit functional here, what you have is a deep learning uh, or deep network. And this deep network is going to do a uh, similar work that you have here in the uh, functional that you have in the energy-based model. You want to assign again and look for the current sample that you have point, what is the highest probability from the set of predefined classes, and that you're going to assign it as an output, as a, as a current label. So this is, uh, the, this is the evolution that we have seen on the different classes of semi-supervised learning, this uh, energy or classic perspective, deep learning models, and then we have hybrid models. So the hybrid models, we can say, okay, uh, I know that uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of each of set of uh, family techniques, can we merge all the advantage of both the classic perspective and the deep learning tech perspective to have some hybrid model that takes best of both worlds? That means that we can guarantee we know exactly what is happening in the process, have some properties in the model, but at the same time have this astonishing performance from deep learning. And this is something that we are going to revise now. So, okay, so what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each uh, perspective? So we have the traditional perspective. Again, this is an illustration. Uh, sorry, this is a medical domain, but this is the, should be any kind of data. This is just for illustration purposes. And what you're able to see here is what I discussed before. You have uh, in terms of output probabilities and in your particular sample, you will assign the one that is highest. So, but again, what is the advantage and disadvantage of this, uh, this area, of, of each of these categories? So let's start with the classic perspective. The classic perspective we have theoretical understanding of the process. Then uh, since we have exactly uh, explicit constraints, this theoretical understanding, we know exactly what is happening in the process, what to expect as an output. So this is uh, easier to interpret. And what it was in the past is that actually one of the, of the disadvantage here is that you need to do handcraft features. So these handcraft features limitate as well uh, how how you can uh, you can say about your data distribution, and particularly for instance, if you have a graph-based perspective, this graph-based perspective when you construct a graph, that will depend highly on how how strong are your features extracted from the data, and this is really important, and this is one of the disadvantages in the past. So then we have deep learning models. Of course, we have we delete the disadvantage from the classic perspective. We have Feature generalization, we don't have to worry about handcraft or defining a particular features there. Uh, it scales very well, even if your data uh, grows up exponentially, it's going to be scales well. In the traditional methods, you can handle that, but it's going to be really extremely time consuming. And under certain constraints, for instance, in the graphic pers graphical perspective, you may have some constraint in running or allocate uh, a, a, a your graph if it's not sparse enough. And uh, the down or the disadvantage here in the deep learning models is that you don't have well-established theory. So 
you, you don't know exactly what to expect. It's like a, uh, you can see it, the algorithm techniques as having a black box. Uh, you have some understanding with your uh, logs that you have in there, but there is not as well established theoretical uh, perspective as in the classic perspective. So let's just start with the uh, model-based techniques. So the, again, as I mentioned before, there are different uh, ways to do semi-supervised learning. So there is a generic model. So you have your class distribution. You want to assign and find what what, of, uh, what are these uh, class distribution belongs to to each class that you have. Then you have a low density techniques. So uh, you want to enforce that actually you machine learning technique or your classifier will enforce this boundary in in regions where you have fewer points. And then there is another perspective that is the graph based technique. So in the graph-based technique, you have, uh, instead of the data, you have another representation that is a graph uh, connected by nodes and edges and weights that we are going to go into details in the following slides and some similarity between your data. So this is uh, different ways to do it in the model-based perspective. There are even more, but this is the more uh, well-known in the community. But, but again, go through one of each one, the series, a lecture itself, so we are going to be focusing in a particular one that is the graph-based techniques. So, and, and as we are able to see in the body literature is really extensive since early developments in, in semi-supervised learning. So again, this is semi-supervised learning is nothing new, but, is, but what, what we find in the underpinning theory with the performance of deep learning is really something that has been calling the attention in the community. And for instance, in other downstream tasks, like for instance, deep semi-supervised semantic segmentation, we are able to see that first techniques that we are going to discuss towards the end of this talk uh, are developing in uh, 2018. And, and we are going to see why is these difficulties, why is in classification, there has been like a, a, a long exploration from the classic and deep learning perspective. So, and the question here, okay, we know we start getting into the terms of the classic perspective. Is these models are worth it, are in, uh, strong enough? What are the limitations? So let's, just, uh, uh, let's enter more in details. Again, uh, we are going to go and investigate a particular family techniques that is graph-based semi-supervised learning because all of these single classes or categories that we saw before, they, again, might deserve a lecture itself. So, okay, what is here? Just to uh, formalize semi-supervised learning. What we have is a huge amount of unlabeled data, a tiny label set, and what we want to do is to infer a function f such that we can get a good estimate for the large amount of unlabeled data. And we hope that with minimum generalization error. So, and um, the focus of here is semi-supervised learning with graph-based representation. So what we are having now is not the data itself, but a graph based uh, a graph representation itself. So the data set will be represented by nodes that are connected by edges. And these edges are going to be uh, reflecting some weight between uh, your samples that you have there in, in the graph. So, and that weights are going to be extracted with some similarity measure. So um, this similarity measure can be even in the past, can be half graph. Now, nowadays you can do it automatically, even through a, a, deep, a deep net. So what are the key steps in graph semi-supervised learning? So you have your data, and one of the major complications is how we can construct a robust graph. Because uh, if we think about uh, majority of uh, data can inherently convert into a graph, but there are some areas, for instance, social network, uh, for instance, social network, like uh, any social uh, platform that you have, you, you can find the graph is naturally constructed because you have a friend that is connected to a certain friend and that friend is connected to another friend and the graph is constructed naturally. Here, what we have in the data in remote sensing is that we need to construct the graph. We can say how we can go from this data representation to a graph representation in a robust way. So, and this is an example here uh, of you have a large amount of data, you want to convert it into a graph and in semi-supervised learning, you, the assumption is that you're going to give some samples of, uh, of the set of predefined classes. So here, these points in colors means that a different classes. So just to clarify, this is not class discovery. This is another problem. This assumption of semi-supervised learning is that you know 
what are your set of predefined classes. And if you discover another uh, class, that is different problem here. But just to clarify, the assumption is that you know what are the, your set of predefined classes. And this is one, how semi-supervised learning works. So, and the second major problem is how we can infer the labels. Uh, we have our data, a representation. We went from the data to the graph representation. We have a set of predefined classes. And now how we can use this tiny prior to propagate this information in the graph and uh, finally to get the labels from the large amount of unlabeled data. Okay, so we went uh, revising so far traditional methods and we are going to stop, uh, start with this, a little, a little more details into the classic perspective. So I, again, uh, one of the main goals here is image classification, graph-based perspectives. And when we talk about graph-based perspective, we want to infer the labels for the huge amount of unlabeled data in the graph we can see uh, one of the problems that is how we can do this diffusion on the graph. And this diffusion, what it's saying is that how we can uh, spread this energy that you have into the graph, how this prior knowledge that you have as, as the tiny label set can be propagated and use it to infer the large amount of unlabeled data and how to use it in the a, in a, in a best way possible because it's a tiny prior. And if you have this tiny prior, you have a high yield possible problem. So what you want to do is to have a very good inference as, as much as possible. So when we talk about semi-supervised learning in the graph perspective, one of the major uh, family techniques is what is so-called graph regularized framework. So in this perspective, what we have is a functional that it, it looks like that. You have a, a functional with two terms. One is regarding about uh, how, how you can handle this uh, tiny uh, prior that you have in the data. And the second one is how you can have the explicit constraint to smooth more and more your label, label data sets. So, and here you have a regularization parameter. And again, what you have in here is that you're going to have as an output a set of probabilities. So if you have a, your current sample, what you want to do is say, okay, I want to assign I know that for each set of predefined classes, I want to have several probabilities. I want to assign to the current one, the ones that has the highest one. So usually what you do is to assign this uh, to the current sample, the one that has the highest probability. So this one, we can see it in, in early developments and even in recent developments in uh, hybrid models and deep learning models, we can see as well this kind of uh, regularizing framework here. So one thing that is important to mention here is that how to treat this le tiny level set is very well known in the community. What is happening uh, or what is the major challenge in semi-supervised learning, even if it's classic perspective, deep learning perspective or, or the hybrid perspective is the second term. How we can carefully treat the level data, how, how carefully we can add this constraint to, uh, to reduce this ill poisonous, to reduce the error propagation on on using only this tiny level uh, as a prior. So the major, the major challenge, and it's worth to mention, is about the second term, how we can treat better the label data. So, <clears throat> sorry. So when we talk about a uh, classic perspective, uh, perspective, there has been a lot of underpinning theory development since uh, early works. Perhaps one of that I, want, I would like to mention that is considered a seminal paper is the local and global consistency model from SUO. So you have a quadratic function. And here, if you take a look about the framework that we, we mentioned before, we have uh, uh, the, what I mentioned, how to treat the a tiny level set and the label set. So it's similar here that you have in all the regularizing frameworks, you have a part where you say, okay, I, I don't want that. First of all, I don't want that uh, my, my initial levels that you have, uh, change a lot at the beginning. And the second part is how we, I will constrain this unlabel set that I have there. So this is similar, similar, um, similar emphasis that you have, or you can see in all regularized frameworks that you can see. So, and here interesting part is that actually you can say, okay, even if I have a regular graph, I can handle it here. So you have uh, this constraint here. And what is interesting here is that from there, from these uh, algorithm techniques, many techniques have been developed in the cl classification area. 
like for instance, based on harmonic functions, uh, based on having a different constraint here, uh, even if it's a, a uh, not only the uh, appeal application, for instance. So you can have different constraints here that we are going to see as an example next. But what is interesting here and why a lot of attention has been put in this particular technique? Because this technique, even if was developed in, in 2003, there is an advantage of this. This have a closed form solution. So that means that you don't, you have, you don't have to compute these uh, large interaction, in, in, interac iterations uh, for, for longer period of time on your algorithm technique, uh, on your data. And this has been motivated, even if it was a classic perspective, that has been used for many downstream tasks. If you take a look about the body literature, even nowadays, this, uh, uh, this uh, functional has been used in many uh, other tasks beyond classification. Like some examples are here, like for instance, future learning, deep semi supervised classification, of course, even if it's not a classic perspective and adversarial domain generalization. So this is interesting. Again, this is a closed form solution. If you use it, you, you have some understanding. And this is where hybrid models as well plays an important role. How you can use these constraints with deep learning to have and bust uh, the performance with some understanding about what is happening. So this is uh, considered one of the seminal works in the community. And from there, different works, of course, has been improved and developments but again, the advantage of this model is you have your cross form solution here. And you have different constraints be beyond SUO in 2003, uh, is what I mentioned. You can do the fitting constraint is very well in the community. The most important thing is how you can treat this unlabeled set, even in deep learning perspective uh, that uh, we are going to discuss in a few, how we can improve this smallness constraint. So you can have, for instance, some uh, pillar plasian, you can have some harmonic functions, how you can better uh, do this smallness constraint. And this is some examples that the community has been applied. Again, this is interesting because even up to the day, as some examples that I give here, uh, these functionals have been used as well in recent developments in, uh, in different tasks and machine learning to, to solve not only classification. So that's why it's interesting as well to understand what is happening in the classic perspective because uh, a lot of inspiration can give you for new tasks. So uh, when we talk about deep semi-supervising models is similar uh, line that we have. So just, uh, just a quick uh, comment is similar in deep semi-supervised learning. This is a classic perspective that you have a regularizing framework for the deep uh, semi-supervised perspective. The difference is that this part, again, this is the most important. So what you have here is a different family of techniques and we are going to discuss at least only the case, case example. Uh, for instance, what is so-called pseudo labels. Instead of having this smooth constraint, you can have a network where you can generate pseudo labels. And these pseudo labels are going to help you to, uh, to have your output itself. So this is the, the, uh, this is the same uh, principle that you have, even if it's energy classic perspective, deep learning models or hybrid models. Um, the, one of the most popular ones is this regularized framework. So how to handle the second part is the most difficult one and where there are a lot of uh, works in the community, even if it's, again, classic of deep learning perspectives. Okay, so le let's see how uh, a quick case study in classification. We are talking about so far, so far in energy models. Is it energy models really giving up to the day a good performance? And we will see that even if energy models, uh, some of them are graph-based learning, but they are not deep learning. So still, if you have a particular constraint, we will see in this case study that actually the performance can be really competing with uh, other current, uh, very recent frameworks. So again, quick reminder, as a case study, we are going to do semi supervised classification. So the main task is how we can infer the best way possible the labels for the huge amount of unlabeled data. So again, the main goal is to have, uh, or the main case study that we are going to have here, is a graph-based perspective. So when we talk about the graph-based perspective, we have, again, the data represented as a node connected by the edges. And we have a set of predefined classes. Here you have as an example, again, uh, each color represents a different class. And the main questions here in graph-based perspective is how we can construct a graph, how we can propagate this tiny level set in the best way possible, and how, how we can reduce this computational constraint. Um, 
So if we take a look about the broader literature, there are a scheme that appears in many of the graph-based perspective. And this is based on what we have here in scheme that is a convex and, all, and absolutely p-homogeneous functionals that are here. So if we take, uh, this might look familiar because indeed that appears in many of the uh, algorithm techniques that we have seen since early developments. Uh, and here are only some, ex some examples. There are many, many literature that explore that in a different perspective. It can be uh, with this uh, P equal to two, that is one of the most famous one. Uh, and perhaps uh, you, you, you saw it, that is the SU approach as well. They have a closed form solution, but also as well, there are, you can make it even more, uh, more robust. Like for instance, some functionals that they have with this absolutely P homogeneous functional, but they are related to the total variation. So we are able to see since early developments in remote sensing, these kind of functionals. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have different developments in, in, in classic perspective, and this classic perspective has been done as well in the graph-based perspective, and arriving from the classic deep learning and, high, and the hybrid perspective. So how this energy model works, and we are going to have a quick case study before to go to the next uh, part. Um, so what I want to uh, discuss here is a quick case study that we have uh, we have in we have done in the in the in the part of graph based perspective for hyperspectral classification. So this is a framework uh, that we that uh, that we are we presented in 2020. Uh, we have uh, more recent works, but this is interesting because this is perfectly illustrate the model based techniques that up to the date model based techniques can be a perfect fit for any handling in any large amount of data with some understanding. So we have. Typical preprocessing, we have a, a reduction of the hyperspectral superpixels. Uh, what is doing superpixel, we are going to analyze it more in the next slides. But this is just like a, a quick picture about the, the framework. We are going to go very quickly to all, all the steps and we are going to have as a case study how these model-based techniques works uh, good, even if up to the date. So we have uh, the input and we want to do again is to set assigned uh, to this each sample as a one that belongs to one of the set of predefined classes that we have. So we are going to go a little more detail now about this framework. So what we want to talk about is hyperspectral. So hyperspectral, uh, what you have is not like a RGB that you have three channels, but hyperspectral, what you have is really like a, a really higher number of bands here. So each, each band you have a wavelength here. So this is an example about uh, hyperspectral, uh, how it's reflected here. So that, uh, this is one of the, uh, of the difference. So if people hasn't worked on hyperspectral, you can see it like, as an example, you have seen an RGB and you have three channels. Hyperspectral is even more complex because you can have, uh, instead of three channels, hundreds of channels. And each channel, you might have uh, finer details uh, over and over. Uh, what you are not able to see in a particular wavelength, you are able to see it in, in another one. So that's why hyperspectral, and all bands uh, might contain or contains different and relevant information that you can you cannot see in in a single uh, channel. So, uh, and what we want to do is graph based representation for this case study, and we how we can convert these hyperspectral data. And these ones are all the bands that you're able to see here, like as an illustration. How we can convert this to a graph, and this is something that we are going to see in the next slide. But just as I mentioned, what we want to do is to go for this data representation to the graph representation. So what we want to do is to have uh, each of the uh, pixel and all the bands represented in the graph. And how we can connect this graph, we can have a particular set of predefined features uh, that are very well known in the community. One thing that you can do as well is that actually these, these weights, you can uh, do it through, through a deep learning, uh, through a deep network. So you can extract the embeddings, and then without the automatic embeddings, you can construct the graph. So the, even if it's for the classic perspective or the deep learning perspective, you can uh, get uh, a, a way to go from this hyperspectral data to a graph representation. So, and one thing that appears in majority of hyperspectral image classification to decrease computational uh, constraints is what is so-called super pixel segmentation. So super pixels, uh, there are different, again, familiar techniques. I, I wouldn't go in details. The one that I want to emphasize here is in, in the sense of the, uh, the out, uh, uh, perspective that is the k-min clustering. 
So the main goal is that how you can partition your image, as you're able to see here, in a in a in a in a different region. So these regions, what you want to do is that a set of pixels that you have reflect as close as possible uh, some similitude, even if it's in terms, for instance, some features like, for instance, color intensity. You want to represent this huge. Okay, so maybe someone in mute. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and what you want to do is that these uh, super pixel segmentations, uh, are, you're going to have a partition on your image, again, reflecting this group, uh, certain characteristics that are uh, similar to each, each other. So why you want to do that? Because a hyperspectral uh, data and particularly in general remote sensing is, is large uh, to compute. So if you reduce, uh, I do this partitioning, actually what you want to do is to construct the graph based on, on these regions or these super pixels. So instead of computing pixel wise, the graph, what you want to do is region wise. And this region wise, what you want to do is, okay, uh, I, I'm not going to co compute every single band per every single pixel, but I know that the graph can be even sparser because uh, I, I will not take pixel wise, but region wise. So, and one thing that you want to do is to say, okay, how we can handle better this hyperspectral data. So you can have a clustering distance between them and this clustering distance, what you're going to have is how to better uh, emphasize the graphical approach. So what you have here is, okay, we, we are going to have some spectral, uh, sp spectral features as well, and you can have a different distance uh, that are, are what you want to say is, okay, I want, I know that certain distances between my points are going to line in a certain assumptions in a manifold. So uh, this is something that we, we propose here, some, uh, how we can better uh, propose some clustering distance for hyperspectral classification. Why is this interesting? Because with these distances, if we, if we merge all together, we have reducing computational size from the super technique. And then we can better analyze how are the distances between uh, the data points that you have in the hyperspectral and better manage it with a particular constraint. Then we can uh, we can go and say, okay, I need now the graph. I need how to how how to diffusion this information. And if you remember before, we talked about this energy model from Suo in two thousand four. That, as I mentioned, they have a closed form solution and many downstream tasks in the community has been used even up to the day. If you remember the previous slide where even in the energy analyzation, many, uh, many authors have, have continu continued using this functional. So, and what we want to do as a case example is, okay, we know exactly how to constrain each part of the, of the framework, how we can reduce computational, uh, computational constraints on the graph. If we can do super pixels, for instance, uh, again, these super pixels are, as an example, this division. So the question is how many super pixels you can define. This is uh, like a, a depends of a trade-off between your accuracy and computational efficiency. So, and what we use as a case, this case study is this, again, this energy functional that we uh, revised before. So what are the main constraints here in these algorithm techniques? This algorithm technique works very well in comparison to many, many of existing ones, but still we have limitations here. We have hand graphic features. Like uh, some examples are, uh, as I mentioned before, the ones that we use it in widely in the community, like uh, mean features, weighted features, central features, et cetera. So, uh, and this is one of, of, of the limitations, but the main uh, message here is that up to the date, if you have a pure energy-based model, this one is going to be credible competing with uh, more recent techniques. And even thinking about this framework, you can actually use, for instance, to, re to eliminate this constraint using uh, the impedance for construct the graph with a deep net. So you have a, a deep net. Well, this is hard to write here, but uh, and you can have the impedance. And with this impedance, you can construct the graph and you can eliminate these uh, limitations of the current work. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a particular case study where you can say, okay, even up to the date, energy models and graph-based perspectives are still uh, working and you can see it in many papers, uh, even up to the date in the community. Uh, the advantage is that you have a good understanding of what is happening. Uh, and even if you have some limitations like the handcraft features, 
again, you can eliminate this by using, okay, I, I can think about uh, a deep network. A uh, deep network, what it's going to say is to track automatically the meetings, and then I can construct the graph. So I eliminate this uh, limitation. So here's are some examples, our typical data sets that we are able to see in hyperspectral. There are benchmarkings, Salinas, Indian Pines, and Pavia University. So you have uh, different metrics and different uh, techniques until 2020. Um, and again, even if it's 2020, what I wanted to, to transmit as a message is that energy models, and if you take a look about uh, the new literature 2022, you can see more and more as well, uh, again, different energy models, not only graph-based techniques, but also as well, uh, different kinds of techniques, even generative models from the classic perspective. And you can see that uh, these graph-based uh, models or in classic perspective, you can see that uh, if you exactly constrained your functionals and you know exactly what is happening in your process, you can uh, reach performance that is better than uh, several of the existing techniques. Again, there are some limitations in energy-based models that I mentioned before. Uh, you say, okay, I have a good performance here, but I still have limitations in sense of, I don't want to do handcraft futures. So uh, that's not a problem. You can, uh, something that we are going to mention later is in hybrid models. So how you can combine uh, these deep learning models with energy models to overcome, for instance, this limitation. So, and this is some other examples. Again, uh, this work, uh, the main message here is that as a case study, energy models, and they still continue developing and providing different insights about uh, what is happening in the model, how it works exactly in the model, but we are moving more and more about to use hybrid model, how we can use energy models and deep learning models together to have the best of the worlds. So uh, let me go, I have still a minute. Um, okay, so we saw some limitations here. So what we can get from deep learning. So if I ask you uh, very quickly, distinguish between what is a, a, a dog or a fried chicken, even for us, if it's a natural image, it's hard to get it. And the same, if we can say, okay, this is a chihuahua or muffin, uh, we need to pay more attention. And even if we have been very familiar with uh, chihuahua or muffin, sometimes it's hard to, to distinguish very hard, but very quickly. So this is what we, we can get from deep learning. The disadvantage that we mentioned before here on handcraft and futures, uh, can, this is where deep learning has a major impact. So we can, uh, we can uh, work better than and faster than our eyes perhaps. So, and this is what is happening. This is a quiet deep semi-supervised revolution. Many of their underpinning theory that we have saw in the classic perspective is now applied in the deep semi-supervised perspective. So we have different uh, pseudo leveling. Uh, so if I'm just quick question, uh, do we have, I have still time, for, right? To go for 10 minutes more or so? Yeah, yeah, sure, that's fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, I will accelerate this. Uh, so, and what is happening now is a different perspective. We saw before in the first part, energy with classic perspective. Now I promise to do deep learning perspective. So deep learning perspective, again, works on the same pillars of semi-supervised learning in the classic perspective but we have different methods and different uh, other different constraints here. So uh, when we talk about deep semi supervised learning that comes as an example that I give you in the previous slide is 2017, where this underpinning theory for the classic perspective merged with deep learning. And perhaps one of the major families of techniques in semi-supervised classification is what is so-called perturbation-based methods. So what is this perturbation-based methods? So this perturbation-based method, what is telling you is saying, okay, I have my label data and I want, I want to do a delta perturbation. So the, this delta perturbation, what you want to do in force is that your system performance is not going to change under any delta perturbation. So what is the main problem here is that how we can set this delta perturbation? Because uh, if this perturbation that you have in your data, you can have two types, actually. Let's generalize in two types. One is a weak perturbation, and when I mean when I'm when I'm talking about perturbation means like for instance uh, uh, augmentation like translation rotation this is a weak a weak perturbation but what is happening when we have a very strong perturbation you have change on your sample in intensity uh, rotation translation you have even different regularization that you have in the literature like a cut out so cut out 
you have like a one part of the image completely remove it. So you can enforce even regularization of the network. So this is perhaps one of the most famous or more uh, most currently used uh, family of techniques in deep semi-supervised learning. And again, the main goal is you want to define this perturbation and you want to your system performance to keep it as 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 good as possible, not to decrease it. So uh, again, one of the main major uh, problems is how, how to define this. However, actually we can see new recent developments in the community where, where you can do automatically search for these perturbations. So they, I, I'm not going to talk about that because that itself is uh, deserve a, a full lecture, but how, how you can search automatically this for these deltas is really uh, something that as well has been used more and more in the community in recent years. You have a set of spatial solutions, how, how are the feasible deltas that you can admit? And then you can say, okay, from my data that you, I have, what are the, the one of these deltas that cannot uh, affect the semantics of my data? So this is uh, very quickly uh, taking a, a sneak peek about deep semi-supervised learning and uh, different of the examples. Um, how 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 these deltas can be set, and this is something that I mentioned before. More and more, they have been seen uh, completely works on data augmentation. For instance, one of the most famous one is random men, fast men's population-based augmentation, and this is for non-graph-based perspective. One thing that I would like to mention actually here is that uh, if you think about the um, uh, image level, you can do this augmentation. You can say translate and rotate and do it automatically. But if you think about a graph, the graph, there is not analogous, uh, analogs or the similar analogous that you have for the image uh, augmentations on these perturbations. You can, you are not able to translate, rotate a graph. They are not going to give you any invariance. So uh, there is a different topic, but what you want to do is how you can set these deltas in a graph. So these deltas are going to be quite different if you work in a graph space. So that meaning, for example, instead of translate or rotate, that is not analogous in the graph, what you're going to do is how I can remove an edge or a knot or add an edge or a knot or mask a set of knots and edges without breaking the semantics of my data that is in the graph. So this is like just worth to mention very quickly, uh, data augmentations and what is happening in the community is a full topic, but this is like a worth to mention because one of the keys for the current uh, cu current set of techniques for this semi-supervised learning is that, how you can enrich these perturbations. How, how, this is one of the major contributions on the performance. Uh, okay, so I, I will uh, accelerate a little more here. Sorry for the time, if I'm uh, over time, but it's, it's worth to mention there are different family of techniques. One of that, uh, okay, this is, uh, sorry, let me put, this is, uh, let me put a comma, white hat, and this white hat, uh, over theta, sorry, this here, there should be a white hat. So this white hat is a pseudo labeling. So this is something that I mentioned before. Pseudo labeling is another set of family of techniques beyond uh, perturbation metals. So what is the difference here in pseudo labeling? What you want to do is what is so-called generate some proxy labels. So uh, you have your uh, tiny level set, your label set, so you want to train initially the model with this tiny level set. But you know that there is something the community knows as the uh, inherent uh, confirmation bias in several labeling. What it's telling you is that this initial prediction that you have for this tiny level set is highly uncertain. And if it's very highly uncertain, that means that in following epochs that you're training your model, you're going to propagate this error. So how, how to handle this uh, constraint is one of the major problems in pseudo labeling. How, uh, and this is where uncertainty, for instance, in you can put here a constraint in, in terms of uncertainty, uh, how this uh, uncertainty can be better handled. So you can enforce that this pseudo labeling that you are uh, computing is, is have certain certainty, certain level of certainty. So there are different uh, in pseudo labeling that is another family of techniques beyond the delta perturbations that we saw before or the perturbation based techniques as well. The community has been explored extensively uh, this idea of pseudo labeling, how to improve it. So, and this is what every technique, every family they have this advantage. This is what I just mentioned. This is the confirmation bias in pseudo labeling, how you can treat better certainty 
in your initial prediction so, such that you don't propagate your error. So, and we will take a look about, I will, because of time and I want to show you the semantic segmentation example, I will skip that, but just a big picture is that uh, there is another full topic that can be done in, as a lecture that is graph neural networks for hyperspectral. There are a lot of works as well, and some of them works as well on the assumption on what we know about uh, graph Laplacian, for instance. So uh, because of the time, I wouldn't go in details because I want to show you the, quickly the second case study, but uh, this itself is another uh, topic. So more and more, we have seen combination of not just uh, convolutional neural networks, but as well graph neural networks more and more. Uh, how we can better uh, deal with these futures extraction. And this is itself uh, another thing that we are able to see here more and more, how we can do self-supervised with semi-supervised. Uh, self-supervised is a huge world. And one example is a family of techniques of what is so-called contrastive learning. So contrastive learning, uh, this is nothing but looking for distinctiveness. So for instance, uh, if you have uh, uh, you want to contrast similar samples that are augmented. You have different cats and dogs. You want to see that actually the features that lies on the same class are going to be together. The features that are in the different class, they are going to be uh, separated. You, you imagine a manifold of features. So this is an example about what is some of the trendings as well in semi-supervised, how you can merge this self-supervised with semi-supervised, because again, self-supervised is perfect fit. Self-supervised treated uh, the main what I mentioned before is one of the major challenges deep semi-supervised or classic perspective for semi-supervised is how you can treat better the constraints in the label data. So this is where self-supervised is perfect fit. And we are able to see some trending on this area, self-supervised, semi-supervised. This is an example about graph-based contrastive learning. Uh, again, these are augmentation, uh, augmented versions. And there is a, a whole topic on that. This is just a quick slide about to see what is the trending now how you can merge different holistic techniques with different principles, uh, again, to make better, more and more semi-supervised uh, approach and take advantage of this tiny level set. So I, I should, uh, let, let me uh, skip this part very quickly because of the time, but I want, what I want to mention here is, okay, we talk about classic techniques, we talk about deep learning techniques, and you, you might ask, what about the third part? What about the hybrid models? So the hybrid models, long story short, is about to combine this uh, classic or mathematical constraint with deep learning. So you can get the, the best of all worlds. And this is just uh, a quick example that many of uh, the, uh, parts or systems that you're able to see actually runs on classic and deep learning techniques. Like for instance, some search, uh, browser search that you, you, you can use every day. So, uh, let me uh, go for uh, very quick, quickly the idea of hybrid models. The hybrid models is, uh, as I mentioned before, how we can get the best of the worlds. So uh, uh, for instance, as a case study, we take pseudo labeling with deep learning, what we can do with that. Let me give you an example uh, because I want to arrive to the, the second case study. So you have a tiny label set. This is how to do hybrid models. You, you have a tiny level set and a huge amount of unlabeled data. So. And again, you, have, you can have a, a constraint that is a constraint coming from the classic perspective, a functional, and, and say, okay, this one is going to give me the initial predictions on my graph. But I, want, uh, but I mentioned before uh, how you can get uh, sure that you have certain certainty level. Okay, this is where deep learning comes to play an important role. And you say, okay, I have the initial prediction on the graph, I got to do a check on the uncertainty. How certain are my pseudo labels that I generate here? So uh, are good or not? If uh, I know that initially are going to be not good because this is inherent to the confirmation bias, then enter again to the network, uh, do it again retrain it with the, with the new pseudo labels, that this is the pseudo label generated, and then do again the propagation. So you're going to do this driving optimization, alternating optimization over and over again. So you are getting the best of both worlds, these mathematical constraint with deep learning models. So I'm sorry if I'm running out of the time. Uh, here, one, one of the key question is seek for robustness. There are many, many questions about semi-supervised. Uh, one of that is how you can guarantee this certainty. And there is a, a huge topic about on how, how you can have certainty in deep networks and particularly uh, dealing with uh, the confirmation bias for uh, pseudo labeling and semi-supervised. Uh, 
I want to just to show you the last case study before to finalize and say, okay, this is not about only classification. Semi-supervised learning, we can see it more and more in a different downstream task. This is an ex a quick example about semantic segmentation. I, because of the time, I can go into details, but just, just let, let me tell you that similar principles that we saw today, we go from the classic deep learning hybrid perspective can be used from different other tasks and classification. For instance, semantic segmentation. And surprisingly, uh, different tasks, they, they need different assumptions. So what we know in deep semi-supervised or semi-supervised in classification, not necessarily extrapolates to semantic segmentation because the task is different. You have now pixel-wise, you have video analysis, so you need to have different constraints. And you take a look about the body literature in deep semi-supervised learning for semantic segmentation, you will see that actually initial models start very recent, 2018. Again, this is deep learning. If you take a look about semantic segmentation from the classic perspective, you, you will have, of course, more uh, uh, like, a, like a older papers, but I'm talking about only about deep semi-supervised semantic segmentation. And this is something that uh, is even more complex, how to handle uh, semantic segmentation with tiny level set, uh, where you have different kind of problems, occlusions in the videos. You have uh, deformations in the videos because a person can deform in a different way. How you can handle all of these partial occlusions, uh, you can see in one frame, if it's video analysis, what you can see in one frame, in the next frame can disappear, but then appears again. So uh, just to let you know that all these principles can apply as well to semi-supervised uh, semi -supervised learning to different downstream tasks. Another example is that might be interesting for many of you is semantic segmentation. And I, I will skip this because of the time. Uh, this is just uh, some constraints about uh, the perturbation-based techniques that can be applied to semantic segmentation with uh, certain assumptions. Uh, and with that, I would like to conclude and give you uh, a summarized message. First of all, I would like to draw the attention that Classic perspectives are important. You saw that uh, through this journey on exploring classic and deep learning, you saw that even recent developments on deep learning from different tasks using uh, as well classic functionals. So exploring classic perspective as well is something that is still is going on. Uh, merging classic perspective with deep learning as well is something that is quite interesting in the community. And of course, deep learning itself is a, a go-to in in this area as well. So, and to close this uh, presentation, what I want to do is to say, there is a lot of things to do. And there is a lot of open questions in the community. There are, uh, in particular in semi-supervised learning. And as I mentioned before, there are trend topics now, uh, how you can fusion even transformers, you can fusion uh, as well, uh, self-supervised like in contrastive learning, uh, representation learning as well, uh, that is, somehow the, uh, some family of techniques that you have there in contrastive learning with semi-supervised learning. So this is some of the uh, trends that you can see in the community. Uh, so we're revising past, present, and some trendings that you have. And with that, uh, I would like to thank, uh, again, the organizers and the team. OK, so if you don't have any questions, then we can move forward with the presentation of Dr. Lee Chao Mo. Uh, we have some question. Angelica? Uh, we can't hear you, Angelica. Sorry. <laughs> So we have here a question in the chat. The pseudo-label data might have errors. When you train the model on pseudo-label data, how do you avoid the propagation of these errors? Yeah, that's a very good question. This, this is uh, the one of the phenomenons that uh, we saw that is called the confirmation bias. So uh, initially, you are completely right. Uh, initially, when you have the pseudo-labels, uh, you, you know that the initial inference uh, on this pseudo-label and your label data is going to be highly uncertain. So what, what you need to do is to add these certainty constraints. For example, let me give you an example. A quick way to measure uncertainty is an entropy. So you can say, okay, uh, I have initial prediction of my label data with pseudo labels. I will measure how certain they are. So what you imagine how, how, how is going to be the representation is that you have a plot 
when you have initially, what are the, the with respect to the ground truth, what are these, uh, let, let me show you maybe uh, uh, if I had found this uh, a plot here, that is regarding your question. Uh, yes, but yes, here. So, and this is, this is uh, where uncertainty matters. So, uh, you know that uh, uncertainty, you're going to have a high uncertainty in your model. So what you need to do for the training is to have a constraint here. I didn't go into, I didn't uh, go into details on that, but you have a, a, a constraint here in uncertainty saying uh, there are a lot of literature in uncertainty. As an example, I give you an entropy that is, has been a long story about to how to measure uncertainty. So what you want to do is ensure that you can have many constraints, like for instance, unbalance and uncertainty. And what you want to see is like, a, okay, this uncertainty factor, what is giving you is that uh, uh, initial epochs, you know, that is very high uncertainty to your label data. So this red is how much, um, how, what are the, the high uncertainty uh, unlabeled, so the labels that you have. And you're able to see that if you enforce and do a check of uncertainty, when you reach, uh, you're enforcing that these errors are not propagated in following epochs. And when you have yeah. epoch 100, what you're able to see is that these erroneous pseudo labelings are going to reduce, are you going to have a high certainty in your pseudo labels? Okay. So just as a shared, uh, constraining your loss that you have with some uncertainty factors is really important for pseudo labeling. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. So if we don't have any more question, we will proceed with uh, the next lesson from Dr. Lichamo. Okay, uh, just to make sure, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, cool. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ID, uh, IDF Summer School. My name is Li Chang Mo. Uh, and today um, I'm going to talk about some, something about semantic annotation of human size images with uh, sparse annotations. Uh, actually, uh, this is a, a, a kind of weekly supervised semantic segmentation of human size images. Um, okay, uh, and here is a good map of my uh, talk today. Um, uh, basically, in this talk, uh, I will introduce why we want to use sparse uh, annotations in semantic segmentation. Uh, how we build the data set and train models on such data. And finally, some experimental results will be shown. Uh, I don't want to uh, just to show, you know, the, the algorithm stuff uh, we, we used. Um, I want to show the whole pipeline um, about the weekly supervised uh, uh, assessing image uh, semantic segmentation. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the semantic segmentation uh, in processing. Uh, I will see that it is a fundamental task in uh, in the processing community, um, and the startups in this field can benefit uh, a, a wide range of ap applications. For example, urban planning, land use, and land cover mapping, and uh, disaster management. Uh, semantic segmentation uh, is, of course, very important in our uh, community. Uh, then, uh, what does semantic segmentation actually do? Um, in this task, a, a model or a deep network okay. train is supposed to, to uh, classify every pixel um, into a semantic class. For example, we, we want to know and this pixel is car or tree or building, something like that. Uh, nowadays, I guess most of you have already heard about deep learning, right? Uh, it is a super powerful tool in visual recognition tasks. 
Uh, and of course, many achievements have been uh, obtained in semantic semantic and many well-known models are proposed, uh, such as uh, FCN, UNET, and the deep plan. Uh, a common pipeline of deep learning model is that you, you have some uh, input images and then you fill them into a stack of uh, convolutional layers, pooling layers, and uh, fully, uh, fully connected layers. Uh, finally, the output is supposed to be, uh, you know, the semantics and uh, masks uh, you expect. Uh, however, uh, before you can reach this, uh, you have to first train your models. Um, then here comes the problem. So we expect to know the, the class of each pixel. Then we have to first collect a lot of pixel-wise annotations. Usually people create such annotations by manually labeling each pixel. And this process is, um, is very painful, you know, and, and very time consuming. So let's see this example. Imagine that you are you are labeling these trees and uh, you have to carefully draw their, their boundaries. And uh, you have to uh, figure out what is uh, in, the uh, in, the, in the black region in the shadow shadow regions. Uh, obviously that sometimes it is uh, pretty hard because um, we, we cannot actually see something in the shadow uh, region. So it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult to, to get a pixel wise annotations for some hard regions. Uh, and remember that uh, you need to annotate hundreds of thousands of them, not one or two images, but hundreds of thousand images. So now I, I guess you can feel how, how hard it is to create pixel-wise dense annotation for the semantic annotation of frame size images. Uh, when, uh, okay, well, uh, then uh, actually we, we think about this, this question. So we, we want to know, can we uh, elevate such annotation burden? To address this issue, we aim to learn deep learning models with sparse annotations. Uh, and in this uh, lesson, uh, I will introduce uh, three types of uh, sparse annotations, which are point level annotations, scribble level annotations, and uh, uh, polygon level annotations. Here are some example annotations of the class of tree. Uh, as you can see, to label a tree, we simply draw a point or a scribble or a simple polygon with it. Uh, we don't have to you know, carefully draw the, the boundary of the trees in the image. This can be super time saving and easy to do. Uh, now uh, we, we come to the data introduction section. Um, the sparse annotations bring to new characteristics. First, only a small uh, portion of pixels should be labeled. And that it is to say you, you don't have to label uh, every car or every tree, every building in the image. Uh, so this can save you a lot of time for labeling. And second, objects do not need to be entirely annotated. Yeah, for, for the tree, you just uh, click a point um, inside the tree regions. You, you don't have to label all pixels of the tree. And this uh, brings a third characteristic that is uh, uh, you can avoid complex boundaries and ambiguous pixels. Yeah, for example, here uh, you don't have to label uh, uh, objects in the shadow regions because basically you can you can you can see nothing right in these regions. Okay, uh, then. Uh, I want to introduce how we create these sparse annotations. Uh, here we use uh, an open source software called LabelMe and our labeling tool. And the first step is to create an empty collection within this body. This body collection, just click it. Um, 
then we, we, we define the name of this collection and sparse annotations. This is the first step. Uh, afterwards, uh, we need to upload all images to this collection by clicking the, the button with pictures. We click this button and upload our, our pictures. Uh, afterwards, when we enter the collection, we can see images we just uploaded. Uh, to create annotations, we, we need to use this button with a polygon. Um, let's first try to create it point level labels. Here, we need to double click the button and position. And the position uh, we want to label. Then a window will drop out where we need to tap the class, class name in. So I'm just pointed located in building. So here we just uh, say, okay, the object uh, uh, or the, the semantic class of this point is building. We tap building. Uh, and of course, one point is not enough. So we, we need to draw more points in this image. And um, please note that here, points should cover all classes. I mean, not all objects, but all classes should be covered because uh, we want to make sure that the network can learn every um, every class during the training time. Besides, it is better that points can also cover objects of diverse appearances. Take the car and and the uh, and the example. Uh, it uh, would be better if you can annotate um, not only white cars but also some black cars or the yellow cars in order to ensure that samples we collect are as rich as uh, possible. Uh, finally, let's do some coding to transfer point and coordinates into masks. Um, and here, just a trick, um, because we click one point in the image, right? So basically in the, in the segmentation mask, only one point only one pixel is labeled and uh, for example, and uh, and the uh, um, Y and all uh, other pixels are zero. Uh, this is not good for network training because uh, labeled pixels are, uh, uh, are not enough for, for the uh, sufficient network learning. So here a trick is that we extend the pixels uh, a little bit or example um we 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 uh, around this around this pixel we annotate the surrounding pixels and the car also yeah this is reasonable because uh a pixel and its uh, neighbor pixels belong to the same class in most cases so oh sorry uh so finally we can get the point level annotations Okay, so, uh, now we go to the second type of annotations that is scribble level annotation. Uh, please pay attention that there's no direct way to create a scribble level labels in this uh, software in the label me uh, because this software doesn't provide a, a function of uh, create a line uh, and shape annotations. So uh, here, what we do is that we first draw a line with several cl uh, clicks in the, in the uh, object we want to label. Then uh, click the starting point. Click the starting point and ending point to finish the drawing because uh, like this, yeah. Like this, the ending point is the starting point. Then we can get a polygon. Uh, okay, then uh, we need to do some coding uh, uh, to generate a line from the coordinates to the masks. All right, uh, now. Uh, you, you can see that some polygons cover multiple objects. Yeah, for example, here, this polygon 
covers roads, trees, and a part of buildings. But this doesn't, uh, this doesn't matter because we just want the, the curve, this curve, right? Um, and we will remove this line yeah, in the end. So uh, then we do some coding to remove this line and just to keep the curve we want. And uh, then we can get the the final uh, uh, the scribble level annotation for for this image. Okay, and the last and for the last type of annotation uh, is super easy because the label me software provides the the function of uh, drawing polygons. So we just uh, select this function and draw some polygons. And tap the of course tap the name of the class. Yeah, like this we can we can draw a lot of polygons, and this is the uh, the mask we can get. Okay. Uh, now let's 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 come to the two data set we started in this work. Uh, the first one is the Wahingin data set, which is proposed by ISPRS. In this data set, 60 images and their pixel-wise annotations are available. Among these images, we uh, relabel 11 images and use the other five images with pixel-wise dense annotations to, to test the network performance. The average image size is 2,494 by 2,064 pixels. And their spatial resolution is uh, nine centimeter per pixel. And three bands are included. Uh, they are, they are uh, NIR, R, and G. All pixels are classified into five classes, which are uh, uh, impervious surface, building, low vegetation, tree, and car. And the second uh, data set we use is the Durek Summer data set. And here, uh, 20 images are provided in this data set, and we relabel 15 of them to tree networks. The average image size is uh, relatively smaller, uh, which are 1,000 by 1,000 uh, and 150 pixels. And the uh, spatial resolution is uh, 62 centimeter per pixel. Uh, we use uh, NIR, R, and J bands uh, um, of each pixel. Eight classes are defined here. They are um, road, building, tree, grass, bare soil, water, railway, and swimming pool. Uh, and regarding annotation, to annotate images, we invite four annotators where Two are room assessing experts, and yeah, the, the guys in our community, and the other two are no experts. Basically, they have no idea about uh, deep learning, machine learning, and room assessing. So we ask them to follow these two rules. Um, first, for each class, annotator annotations are supposed to cover diverse appearances. Yeah, for example. For cars, um, we want them to, to label not only white cars, but also black cars, yellow cars. Um, it should be located in different uh, positions of the image. And second rule is that object boundaries are not required to be drawn uh, precisely. Uh, besides considering the time, cost, and the numbers of samples, we ask and teachers to label at least seven points, five scribbles and three polygons per, per class in each image. And here we uh, we, we see uh, what we get finally. So we have four annotators. So numbers uh, reported in this table are the mean value. Of course, numbers of labeled pixels are far smaller than those of pixel-wise dense annotations but we only need to spend less than four minutes to annotate one huge image, which is really fast. 
Uh, another interesting observation is that uh, scribble level annotations need less time, but get more labeled pixels compared to point level annotations. And polygon level labels seem not uh, easy to draw, but can provide uh, relatively more uh, labeled pixels. Uh, here are two uh, examples. And the top row is from the Wahingin dataset, and the bottom one is from the Zurich, uh, Zurich Summer dataset. So they look really sparse and easy to, to, to get. Okay. Uh, now uh, we have data, right? Um, but how we train networks on such annotations? Uh, due to the number of available training samples is significantly reduced uh, compared to dense annotations. We cannot fully rely on supervised learning in our case. Uh, instead, semi supervised learning is a better choice. And all pixels, even more, uh, even those without labels, can be used to train networks. Therefore, in this work, we uh, present a, a simple semi supervised learning method to learn networks with such sparse uh, annotations. Uh, more specifically, the proposed method is uh, expected to learn to uh, regularize a final prediction from all pixels. Here, we assume that nearby entities often belong to the same um, class. This is our assume, uh, this is our, uh, how to say, the basic knowledge. Now, we uh, propose to regularize uh, feature and spatial uh, relations among pixels in both feature and space uh, and image space. Uh, Okay, let me detail a little bit. In the in the feature space, let's uh, take XI here, XI, uh, and an example. We first find its uh, nearest neighbor. And let's say XNF is the nearest neighbor. Then based on our uh, uh, idea, this these two pixels are very likely to belong to the same class. Therefore, we push them to be as close as possible by reducing their Euclidean distance. Um, meanwhile, we find that if two pixels are far away from each other, it's high, uh, it's very likely that they belong to different classes, right? So here we, we find the pixels um, uh, be further uh, from XI here. And let's say uh, it is X double F, uh, then we aim to push them away from each other. Therefore, we reduce the cosine similarity between them. This is uh, what we do in the feature space and regarding the image space. Uh, in most of the cases uh, for the target pixel uh, XI here, we find it's uh, eight neighbor pixels. Let's see, and that is XNS. And we expect that uh, uh, Euclidean distance between XI and uh, XNS should be as small as possible. Uh, finally, we, we, we uh, come to the whole picture of the, the, the method. Here, alpha, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma are hyperparameters which control the significance of each part. Okay, as to the supervised learning uh, with, with only labeled pixels, we use cross entropy and the loss function, nothing special uh, compared to a supervised semantics and a segmentation. Okay, and then the final loss is, uh, is the um, combination of cross entropy loss, that is for the, for the labeled pixels. And the proposed uh, uh, loss terms here lambda is the significance weight. Okay, now let's come to uh, experimental section. Uh, in our experiments, we use FCN 16S and the baseline model, and the test is performance on our uh, reproduced data set with sparse annotations. 
And before training FCA, we crop large scale images into small patches with a size of 256 by 256 pixels. We set the hyperparameters in the in the method um, as 0 0.5, 1 0.5, the y. Uh, as to the lambda, we empirically set it to 0 0.1 when training FCN on the Wahingi data set and 0 0.01 on the Zurich uh, uh, summer data set. The learning rate is set to 0 0.0002. To refine final predicted segmentation masks, we also uh, make use of dense, um, um, con dense conditional random forest, dense CRF here, uh, and the post uh, processing method. Okay. Uh, well, uh, here is the, uh, the numerical results on the Wahingi data set. So we have four variants of annotations uh, offered by four annotators. We report uh, results in the format of mean plus the minus standard deviation. Uh, and we can see uh, using and the proposed CMA support the learning method and the dense CRF uh, can, can improve the network performance on all types of uh, 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 sparse annotations. Uh, besides, uh, it, is, it is interesting to see that using scribble level annotations can lead to the best performance. And this could be attributed to the fact that the number of pixels per object grows uh, uh, faster for polygons and, the, and nearly for the lines. And this would lend to a more balanced uh, weighting of uh, differently sized objects in, in the case of large annotations and uh, under weighting of smaller objects in, in the case of polygon annotations, which could harm the model's performance. Uh, another reason could be that uh, sign drawing a line is faster than drawing a polygon. Annotators for the, for the scribble uh, uh, features provide more. Uh, 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 samples in the same time budget. Uh, if we check the performance of FC, uh, FCN trained on the dense annotations, um, it's also surprised to see that in some classes, FCN learned with sparse annotations can achieve compar uh, comparative or even better performance. The reason may be that for example trees here, uh, they show very similar appearances in the in the images, and then limited training samples are already enough. Um, uh, for, uh, in other words, for for the for the class of tree, even you have more uh, training samples, the the performance of network would be increased. Uh, okay. Uh, and of course, uh, but for, not, not surprising for some small um, objects, for example, car here. Um, FCN learned with sparse annotations perform really on a uh, satisfactory, I would say. Okay, here are some, um, some pre prediction examples. Um, if we have a look at the, the bottom row, uh, the three cars um, are successfully segmented and they are in good shape. Besides, the gap between trees is also uh, detected. And here uh, are some, some uh, predicted masks of the whole images. We can see that in general, the network can identify trees, buildings, um, uh, various surfaces and grass, which uh, proves that sparse annotations are really promising. Uh, just to recall, um, we only need to spend two minutes or three minutes labeling one large scale images. But details, again, uh, are not satisfactory, such as boundaries are, are not well predicted, especially for buildings. And the cars are difficult to recognize. 
And here are our numerous Kuritas on the Zurich, uh, Zurich summer data set. Similar uh, uh, phenomena can be ob observed at will here. Uh, in some um, classes, such as the water and swimming pool, I've seen learned with sparse annotations show uh, comparative performance compared to the network using dense uh, labels. Uh, besides scribble level, uh, labels lend to the higher uh, the, the, the best of scores as well. Uh, here are some prediction examples on the Zurich uh, summer data set. If, if we have a look at the bottom uh, row, it's interesting to see that such a narrow road here. Oh, sorry. Uh, a, a, a narrow road here can be recognized by the network. Uh, in the top row, FCA learned using our method can better distinguish soil from grass. And again, here are some predicted masks of whole images. It can be seen that the general layout of land covers can be recognized, but again, uh, details are not good enough. Well, let's come to the to the conclusions and outlooks. Uh, for for points here, first, as sparse annotations can uh, validate a huge annotation burden to a large extent. The so work supposed to take hours or days can be done within only several minutes, and even uh, more experts can join uh, labeling, which saves a lot of labeling budgets. Uh, second, the learning with sparse annotations is valid. As we, can, as we showed before, networks learn with um, our simple statement supervised learning method can achieve good, good performance. Uh, third, uh, leverage the proposed method can improve the network performance compared to fully relying on supervised learning. And the last point is uh, uh, the future works can put effort in figuring out more uh, effective and efficient uh, method for this weekly supervised systematic simulation task. If you are interested in this work, uh, you can find the data uh, and codes by scanning this QR code or uh, uh, just to check this GitHub project. And thank you for listening. That's all from my side. Uh, thank you, Dr. Li Chamo. So, <clears throat> Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, any question from the audience? I, I have a quick question. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, sure. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is my name is Jason. Um, I just had a quick question. Not really a high level. Sorry for being so simple. But with the the label me software, did you uh, happen to compare other labeling software and uh, pick label me as the best, or was it just what was available? Or uh, I'm curious of the 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 path to getting to there. Okay. So you mean. Uh... Can we compare our method with other works or the labeling results? Well, so the the you know the data that you're using is very important with most endeavors, and I noticed that you're using a piece of software called Label Me, and I was wondering if you compared Label Me with other pieces of software that did labeling or enabled labeling, and chose okay. Label Me because it was the best or or some other reason. Okay, got it. You you mean the the software? Uh, actually, we. Uh, 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 we checked uh, uh, some other label tools, uh, um, but finally we choose label me because uh, it is open sourced. Uh, uh, and of course we find some better labeling tools, um, but we have to pay. <laughs> so this is the reason why we choose label me. Uh, okay, I see a uh, financial restraint yeah. or constraints. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, okay.
So if we don't have any further question, uh, I suggest that we take uh, five minutes break uh, and then we start with, uh, with the next part of our lesson from 11.50 or so. So see you everyone in five minutes.
Hi everyone. So we are back uh, to our lesson. Uh, can any of you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, you can. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm Sudipan Shah from Technical University of Munich, uh, practically from the same research group as our previous speaker. Dr. Licha Mo. So our two previous speakers mostly spoke about uh, semi-supervised learning uh, with uh, particular use cases. Uh, however, my uh, lesson will be a bit more general, although I will also show some particular cases, mostly from uh, change detection because uh, that intersects uh, with my re own research. Uh, I know that uh, you guys had some exposure to change detection already yesterday, so I think it will not be so difficult to understand. Yeah, okay, so let's move forward. Uh, first, let's try to understand like different uh, learning paradigms that we have. So first one that we all know is supervised learning, right? Where we learn with labeled data. That is, we have a large data set, uh, and the data set is uh, manually labeled uh, somehow. And we use this uh, manually labeled data set to train a model and then for uh, deployment purpose. However, these feature representations that are learned, or like in this large data sets in supervised manner, can also be transferred. Uh, to other like uh, domain specific data sets, which are like different from the larger data set on which we have trained, right? We'll come to this in the next slides. The other learning paradigm is uh, unsupervised learning, where our goal is generally to learn with unlabeled data. That is to find some patterns in the data, like clustering, okay? So when we think about clustering, of course, the name that comes to our mind is something like k-means clustering. Uh, so this is unsupervised learning for sure. Uh, however, in the era of deep learning, this has been extended to more sophisticated approaches like deep clustering. Uh, also dimensionality reduction, okay? Like uh, principal component analysis, which used to have uh, previously in the machine learning, mm, traditional machine learning and right now like in the era of the deep learning we have auto encoder so this is also unsupervised learning another learning paradigm is self supervised learning so self supervised learning is essentially uh, a subclass of the unsupervised learning uh, where also we are trying to learn some representation with unlabeled data uh, however to learn this useful feature representation uh, we use some kind of pretext tasks. Uh, the term self supervised refers to creating its own supervision. Uh, so, yeah, so we, in addition to these three, we also, of course, have semi supervised learning, uh, which we saw a lot in the last two hours. Uh, so, I will not touch upon the semi supervised learning in my lesson. Okay. So let's move forward. Let's first move forward with the supervised learning or rather the question that how uh, the supervised learning itself is not of our uh, interest for today's lesson. Uh, what is of interest is uh, how we can use a model that has been trained in supervised fashion for some other task or for some other data set. Uh, so we have like quite few options here. Uh, would, would anyone like to uh, uh, step forward and uh, like uh, say something like uh, probably uh, what can be the answer for this? Like how we can use the model which has been trained in supervised fashion on some other data set or some other task? Uh, like maybe 
like maybe we can use like like domain like domain adaptation concepts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah right 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 that's right yeah we can use domain adaptation concepts uh, which we'll see in the next slides this is one of the uh, option anyone else something else in your mind Okay, so we, we got one nice answer, domain adaptation. Uh, there are also a couple of other options. Uh, so let's see what are they. So today we'll discuss about three choices, uh, but there are actually more, more than three. So the very first choice is just take this supervised model and just use it as a feature extractor. That is your super, your like, you have trained a model that's on the ImageNet, right? Like ImageNet is one of the quite well-known data sets in the computer vision. Probably most of you have heard its name. And then you want to use it on some other data set, let's say use a set, okay? It's one of the known uh, remote sensing data set. And uh, you just use it like you say that, okay, I will not do anything else. I will just uh, take this model and I'll just take it, uh, use it as a feature extractor. That is, I will take one particular layer or maybe multiple layers and take out the features from it. Uh, I don't care that my features are not tuned for this particular data set. So this is the first option, just use as a feature extractor. Uh, then our second option is that somehow to fine tune on the target data. So this also has different options, but one of the most popular choice here is that uh, to train particular layers of the network, more, uh, more specifically, generally, like uh, we train the last layers, last few layers, generally the last fully connected layer of the network on some label data from the uh, target domain. So this is the fine tuning of the target data. And uh, third option we have, uh, which uh, one of our uh, student today uh, uh, told is unsupervised domain adaptation. That is adapt uh, this network with unlabeled target data. Let's say we have a lot of unlabeled target data. So we can now uh, adapt this short strength uh, network on uh, this unlabeled target data using domain adaptation techniques. So we'll touch over all three of them. So first let's start with uh, the first option, right? Just using a say, feature extractor. So, yeah, like how can we use it as a just as feature extractor? We select a layer, as I sh showed you here over with this uh, green marking, we select a layer and we just apply the input image from the target domain and we take out the features from here, right? Or we can even like, uh, instead of just one layer, we can take these features from multiple layers. Uh, so let's see like some practical, application of this, like just using as a feature extractor. So one of the practical application that we can think of is in remote sensing change detection. So let me just give you a bit of like a couple of minutes introduction to change detection if someone of you are not aware of it. So change detection is a kind of multi-temporal image analysis that is analysis of image of the same object or place acquired at the different times. Uh, so Change detection basically is like uh, has two images, pre-change image and post-change image, and we have different kinds of changes here, right? Like uh, two different kinds of changes marked with the two different boxes, as we can see. Now, in the literature, generally for change detection, unsupervised methods are preferred because it has some challenges, particular challenges with respect to supervision. Uh, uh, generally, it's difficult to call it large-scale multi-temporal label data set because it's not you are annotating not just one image here, you are annotating multi-temporal image, right? So it becomes more complex. And uh, even if you end up uh, labeling a data set, uh, there are several issues with the label data sets, like including generalization to new task or new area. And sometimes in some change detection application, like in disaster management, it's quite impractical also to uh, go for supervised approaches. So in, uh, these are the reasons that unsupervised methods are preferred. And here comes the technique that we just uh, told, right? That uh, using uh, a supervised 
tasks using a network trained in supervised manner, just as a feature instructor to design an unsupervised change detection mechanism. How we come in the next slides. So this is the mechanism, deep change vector analysis, okay? Uh, so let's say you have two images, X1 and X2, pre-change and the post-change. Uh, and let's say you have a network, okay? You have a network over here, which you have trained for some other task. Maybe it's trained on ImageNet, let's say. Maybe it's trained on a semantic segmentation data set, but uh, not re really like uh, from the specific target area of this X1 and X2, okay? So you chip in this network here and you extract a set of features, which we say deep feature from this X1 and X2, right? And let's say this set of features, we can call them F1 and F2, okay? This, this F1 and F2 will have like uh, variable size of dimension, depending on like which layers are you uh, choosing to uh, take the features, right? Like let's say you are taking the feature from the first layer of the CNN and let's say the first layer of the CNN has 64, uh, 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 the filter kernel is 64. So this F1 and F2 will be like 64 dimensional. If you are taking it from the second layer and let's second layer has 256 dimensional feature. So it will be 256 dimensional. It, it depends, okay. So now you take this F1 and F2 and what you can go for, you can simply go for a deep feature difference. What you obtain, is deep change vector, which characterizes, and uh, okay, if it was not clear, let me be uh, clearly uh, tell you that this operation is going on like pixel by pixel, okay? So for each pixels in the analyzed area, what we get is uh, deep change vector characterizing the change information, which we call as a G. And then we can go for an operation called deep change vector analysis to obtain uh, unchanged class omega n c and different kinds of change classes omega c1 omega c2 omega ck so how how do we do that let's uh, go a bit more in the next slides uh, okay so uh, what kind of network can we use uh, uh, for this task ideally something which has been pretend for semantic segmentation why because our change detection this is a uh, semantic is this is a task which is quite similar to semantic segmentation, right? Like a semantic segmentation with binary classes. So in this particular uh, case, we used a network which was trained on the Potsdam data set, but uh, okay, this is not something mandatory. You can do anything else also. However, features should be selected from the convolution, deconvolution layers only. Uh, why? Because you cannot select feature from the fully connected layer because there uh, you cannot, can't obtain the information corresponding to each pixel, right? There your image has like uh, collapsed to a single vector. So we need to select the features from convolutional and deconvolutional layers only. We can form a hyper column of uh, these uh, features, which practically what it implies is a multi-scale representation of this multi-temporal information. And then we can like, in this case, we used a variance-based strategy to select uh, uh, like select a set of features that emphasize the change information, but okay, this can be replaced with something else. Let's not go into this right now. So this is what I'm practically talking about. Let's say you have selected few layers. Don't pay attention to the numbers, but just think, okay, like let's say you selected these certain layers for taking the fit out the features. And as you can imagine, like what happens in a CNN, as you go deeper, uh, your like if your input was 224 cross 224 uh, uh, later like your uh, feature size the spatial size will uh, start reducing right so we need to bring back by spatial interpolation all of them to the original size of the input image and then we can aggregate those features okay we what we get is the diff feature hyper vector corresponding to one image and each pixel of this one image the diff feature hyper vector once we have this deep feature hyper vector, we can go for obtaining the deep change vector by taking a difference, right? That's what we are doing. Like this is F1 and F2. These are the deep feature hyper vector or deep feature vector, whichever way you want to call it. We do a deep feature difference and we get G, deep change vector. Then we can do a magnitude based analysis to cluster this into two types. One is 
change group and other is some change group how the, uh, this f1 and f2 this characterizes uh, these two images right x1 and x2 each pixel and this g this is a difference now if you take a magnitude what do you expect we expect that for the changed pixels the magnitude will be higher whereas for the unchanged pixels the magnitude will not be so high right so we cannot take a like a threshold based approach to get these change pixels omega c here now once we have this omega c we can take out these pixels okay let's say like these are the some pixels which are distributed over here uh we can take this omega c and we can do some more analysis to obtain the multiple or multi class change information so this is practically a clustering operation over the change pixels to group them into k different categories omega c1 omega c2 to omega ck uh yeah so what we see is a magnitude based analysis to first get which pixels have changed in the analyzing and then to take out these change pixels and to cluster them into different k different categories uh of different kinds of change okay so let's go a bit uh, more details uh so this is what i told you already about the binary change detection that this is a magnitude based analysis uh the magnitude row is calculated as l to norm of the deep change hypervector g that i showed you in the last slide the g over here so as l to norm of this we can obtain the magnitude row and we have this magnitude row from all the pixels in the analysis right and uh, uh, what happens is that the change pixels have higher row mm -hmm. and the unchanged pixels have lower row so if we if we plot a histogram of this row what we'll see is something like this and our change pixels with the assumption that with the assumption that change pixels like generally like in most of our application change pixels are only few this is where with threshold t you can segregate these change pixels like these are the change pixels and these are the unchanged pixels okay uh, and this threshold can be obtained using any suitable like uh, algorithm so one of the popular method is atso's method i will not go into the details of atso's method but uh, yeah it's quite popular method you can go in, uh, you can read about it so let me be clear all this is with an assumption that only some part like of the image has changed right like in the normal scenario it will not be applicable like if you take a like a scenario like uh, maybe currently uh, currently in ukraine maybe some place which has been bombarded to like uh, till the end and everything has changed uh, uh, then this assumption doesn't hold uh, then this kind of unsupervised change detection uh, this uh, fails practically yeah yeah okay so uh, let's see some result no okay no before that let's talk a bit also about the multi class change detection right so what i told you before is that we what we get here is omega c the change pixels uh, which are practically here the omega c uh, beyond the right side of this threshold t okay uh, now we will cluster this omega c okay again based on this deep change hypervector which is practically high dimensional vector right deep change hyper vector is high dimensional vector so this is not trivial to cluster however considering the change pixels property what we are likely to have we are likely to have the components of this g which are either positive or negative right so what we can do to simplify this information in this g okay so what i'm saying that g this g can be like a dimension can be 64 256 even higher okay uh why even higher because if you remember like actually we are taking the features from the multiple layers so it can be like let's say this one is 64 256 512 yeah so it can be quite high uh so what we can do is this we can binarize this g to simplify the information to make our like uh, clustering process is a bit more efficient or a bit more comprehensive let's say when you binarize this deep change hyper vector what we get like this are, this is a, like a very simple uh, example uh like where like all the components are positive so the binary g what we see is all of them are one uh whereas uh here all the components are uh negative 
So the binary density, what we see here is all of them are zero. So this is a uh, very simplified example. Uh, in reality, of course, it will be not so simple. Uh, it will be like a more pattern of like one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, something like that. However, now, if you think about this as like vectors itself, uh, we can find like the most informative uh, vector in the like the G, like the most informative component of G, okay? Considering like given which the, all the others of them are becoming redundant, right? And since this has a, like a binary value, okay, one or zero based on this value, like let's say this is the one, this first feature in G is the one, so which is the most informative feature. Uh, and since this has a binary value one or zero, depending on its value, we can now group all the pixels into two groups, right? Uh, and then we can find the next most informative feature. And depending on that value, again, one and zero, we can uh, cluster into two more groups. So this is a like a kind of iterative hierarchical clustering. I'm not going to the more details of this because this is not actually uh, so much related to the actual uh, discourse of today's lecture. But this iterative hierarchical clustering, you can go through the paper if you're interested can be used to obtain the multi-class change information. So one thing we need to be careful here is that our method, since it is a, like a completely unsupervised method, it doesn't have any previous information, right? About uh, what kind of changes are present or all. Uh, what it's trying to just make sense is a kind of clustering, like semantically making sense of, okay, maybe this makes sense. This kind of transitions might have happened. And what you find is that, uh, what it finds by this iterative hierarchical clustering is actually like uh, matches with the reality uh, quite a lot. So this is one example I will show very quickly uh, on wall view two images where the pre-change image and the post-change image were acquired also in like uh, two different seasons. Uh, and yeah, like uh, they show like urban uh, very high high resolution plus urban complexity plus different seasons and different acquisitions angle. That's very important. Acquisition angle difference of more than six degree, which when this work was done was a bit uh, like uh, something to be highlighted about. I know like since then there have been many other works which have considered this kind of use cases and uh, have uh, uh, like successfully tackled them. Okay, so and this is a like a multi-class reference map, right? So let's first uh, see the result with respect to the binary change detection. What you see is the result with respect to the distinct change vector analysis. That is the method that I just introduced to you. And these were the some methods which were state of the art back at that time. Okay, uh, this is something to be highlighted. Okay, back at that time. Uh, and what you see is that the result, uh, uh, like I'm, I didn't put the like the sensitivity, specificity, this kind of scores here, quantitative scores. I don't want to bore you with the numbers, but what is more important is that whereas the previous methods, they could not capture the object shape that well, this one captures the object shape quite well. Why? Because this is used in the deep features, right? Even though this deep network was not trained on these images, in spite of that, the deep networks, they capture the object information quite well, right? So this is one of the motivation be behind like why we want to, why we want to like use these deep net networks, like even though like it's often difficult to train, like often difficult to find annotated data set on your particular data, particular area of interest, still we want to use these deep networks. Uh, this is the reason because they capture the object information quite well, which was previously like not so easy in the specifically in the case of the remote sensing. This became much more convenient with the availability of the deep networks and the availability like in many cases, even with the network which has not been trained on images from remote sensing, like a network which has been trained on ImageNet, also quite well captures the uh, object shape for the remote sensing images. If we have a network which has been actually trained on the remote sensing images, which we right now have, right? Like there are so many data sets right now. We are like today in 2022, we have so many data sets right now on the remote sensing data sets also. So we have like data sets covering more or less all of the kind of sensors and 
like let's say one of them sensor is one of those data set is made in like specifically in Europe doesn't matter maybe you want to apply it in Australia it will still be like applicable to quite some extent I'm not saying to 100% accuracy to 90% accuracy but still to quite good accuracy much better than the previous shallow methods this is the main message here okay like uh, if you can uh, I mean deep change vector analysis is just an example but this is the main message here Okay, so I will go on like a few more slides with the deep change vector analysis. So the first claim that we make here is that deep change vector analysis is a generalizable framework. So what we mean is that that uh, the previous work that I showed you uh, was with respect to wall view two images, right? Very high resolution. However, in the method itself, do you see anything particular which is with respect to uh, very high resolution? No, not really. So it can be adapted to any other kind of sensors, given that you have a network, a feature extractor network available for that particular image modality, right? So it could be SAR, it could be hyperspectral or something like that, uh, which I will uh, come in the next slides, okay? Uh, so one of the key use case that we did was on the change station on the Sentinel-2 images, where we use uh, more or less uh, similar architecture, However, what we do uh, interestingly is that what we found was useful is that like instead of taking these 13 channels, Sentinel-2 images all at once, if we decompose them into four different band groups, RGB, SWIR, NIR, and the which, and if we do like this deep feature differencing differently with four different models, okay, this is something I should uh, clear, four different models which were specifically trained on something RGB, something SWIR, something NIR, something which, and then we do this operation for different difference in, in a four different parallel modules. Then at some point we uh, concatenate the information from them. Uh, then it's more effective rather than like trying to do it on a like a trivial like 30 channels all together. Uh, then the rest of the operation is the same that we have G, we can do deep change vector analysis. In this case, in this particular work, we uh, only did for binary chance detection that is uh, omega c and omega nc and here is an example uh, of on the agricultural set, data set and what we see is the reference map uh, and uh, the proposed method like uh, this uh, captures the change information quite well uh, however this is of course like a kind of trivial example because this is agricultural area where like even the uh, traditional methods are also quite uh, good uh, but in the paper, you can read uh, there are like examples also from some other use cases, more complicated use cases. However, the key message here is that uh, sometimes decomposing uh, instead of like uh, going like blindly with like, let's say you have 13 channels, 20 channels, just going blindly, it makes sense to like, you know, like according to the particular like uh, use cases to breaking them into the different groups. And also like how we trained the model for this particular task was is also quite interesting. We used uh, AC GAN, it's a kind of GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. Uh, I will not go into the details. Uh, you can read the paper if you're interested. Uh, this is another use case, building change detection in the very high resolution star images, where uh, what we are trying to do is pretty much similar. Uh, I'm not going into like all the details of like uh, of the deep change vector analysis and all, but what is very interesting here is that when we did this work, there was no particular model trained uh, for the lump of particular feature extractor model. So what I'm saying that deep change vector analysis, this depends on the assumption that you have a feature extractor model, right? But at that point in time, there was no feature extractor model available for the very high resolution star images. How we solve this problem? We didn't also have like a very big, like uh, annotated data set on the very high resolution star images. And you can imagine that if you are, if you want to apply like something on the optical images, you can take even the model train on the ImageNet probably. It's not so much difficult problem because ImageNet the, or the computer vision images and the optical images, they are quite similar, right? But not so much similar to the SAR. Like they, I tried applying, like uh, take the network, which was trained on ImageNet, apply on the SAR images. In my experience, I failed, okay? Someone else can have different experience, but in my experience, I failed. So how we solve this problem, we took uh, at that point, 
we didn't have a, like an annotated SAR data set, but what we had was paired a certain optical data set. That is like, let's say uh, there are images over the Munich captured by the SAR image and also captured by the optical image. And we used cycle GAN, which consists of two generator and two discriminator to train a model, which kind of converts from the uh, SAR image to the optical image and then converts back from the optical image to the SAR image. So if you don't know what is GAN or what is cycle GAN, uh, forget that, but what you can think of it is like a kind of like the optical image and the SAR image which are captured from the same place or which implies the same distribution. Uh, one is acting as a kind of label for the another. It's a very simple way. It's not exactly what is what happens in cycle GAN, but it's a very simple way of understanding like one of them is acting as a label for the other. And in this way, what we get then is this generator. We can take out this generator. And what it says is that this generator, this can be used as a feature extractor. Because when trying to, because from converting from the SAR to the optical image, this is like a, a non-trivial task, right? It's very difficult task. It's actually uh, not 100% attainable at all because there are not all the informations are present. Uh, uh, in the SAR, SAR image are present in the optical and vice versa. Uh, so to do this very difficult task, this generator network has to push itself very hard. And when pushing itself very hard, it has to learn the features from the SAR images, okay? And then this network can be used as a feature extractor for the SAR images for chance detection. In this case, we use for chance detection more specifically for building chance detection, but you could use it for something else as well. Okay. So this is the building chance detection, very high resolution SAR images. Uh, then we show another very interesting case, which is the chance detection in the hyperspectral image. Uh, so let's say you have two, two hyperdimensional images, X1 and X2, the pretty much the framework uh, remains the same, right? Like. Uh, you have a like a kind of model with which you can extract the diff feature from it, from X1 and from X2 both. And then you can perform a like a diff feature comparison and analysis to obtain the G, which if you remember is a diff change vector. And then you can do a binary change detection to obtain change pixels and non-change pixels, right? However, what was interesting, very interesting over here is that there is no such trained model available for the hyperspectral images. More specifically, if you think about like one hyperspectral sensor, which has maybe 230 bands, then you take another hyperspectral sensor, which maybe has like 200 bands and those band compositions are different. So even if you are able to train a model somehow on one hyperspectral sensor, doesn't easily is not easily adaptable on another hyperspectral sensor, right? So what we did very interesting here is that we showed that in this kind of case, if we even instead of training, like having a trained model, if we, even if we just initialize a model, okay, with one of the weight initialization technique, even then we can use this as a feature extractor and we can obtain pretty good result, at least better than like the traditional shallow methods. So th this is a, like a, a very interesting case. And also this, this particular case is interesting because uh, in this case, we our network is quite simpler than the one for the multispectral optical images and all. So maybe it makes sense to see a bit of this, the code over here because this, this will be more, much more easier to understand than the code for the SAR image or the code for the optical image, which are a bit more complicated. Uh, but the code for the optical image and all is also pub publicly available on my GitHub. Uh, you can use it, but uh, this particular one is a bit much more simpler to understand. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, so before going for the code, let's just see an, like a, an example uh, on Santa Barbara scene, uh, which is also publicly available data sets. You see pre-change image, post-change image. You see the reference image, okay. Uh, the uh, Ignore the gray pixels. This is where like the uh, reference uh, label was not available. However, what you can see is that uh, the proposed method uh, can obtain, uh, uh, like if you see the matches between this white and the uh, white areas here and the black and the black areas there, it matches quite a lot. Uh, yeah, so if you see in the paper, we, there are like a lot of quantitative co uh, competitions also, which I'm not going into right now. However, uh, let's go into the code uh, uh, a bit, yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll see the code. Uh, 
and we'll try to understand a couple of aspects of this. Uh, so I will share the, uh, I will also show the code now on the screen, but I will also share the uh, code link in the chat box. So if you want, you can download, I will give you like two or three minutes to download if you want to open in your own uh, computer, let's say. Okay, so I share the code link uh, uh, in the chat. Oh, sorry, uh, I didn't share to everyone. Uh, yes, I've shared the code link in the chat and uh, uh, you can uh, download it if you want. Uh, uh, in any case, I will also show it uh, on, the sc on my screen uh, and then we'll like uh, have a look on this uh, for a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, in a couple of minutes, we'll have a look on this. Okay, so someone says that it this doesn't. Uh, yeah, it should work because uh, uh, I can open it from my incognito window also, so it should work actually. But in any case, don't worry. Like uh, I will just uh, uh, sh I'll just share my screen right now. Yeah, so let's go on uh, again with our exercise. Yeah, so yeah, so this is this is a code practically. This is shown on a. Uh, uh, Santa Barbara data set that which we just saw right now. Okay, so uh, the, uh, these are some details about this uh, uh, data set. Okay, like some change pixels, unchanged pixels, and some pixels are unknown label. Uh, okay, so the data set itself can be uh, uh, okay, the sensor information can be get, uh, you can get from here, but the data set details you can get from here. This is the actual link to download the data. Okay, uh, so here we are using a manual seed to get like a kind of fixed result, uh, which is very important when we are working with deep learning, right? Like we want to use a manual seed so that our uh, result is like kind of reproducible. And uh, this is the layer from which we will extract the feature. As I told you that when we are doing deep change vector analysis, we want a fixed layer or multiple layers, let's say. So in this case, we are just taking one layer from which where we want to extract the feature. So these are like some pre-change path, uh, post-change path, reference path, result path. Uh, yeah, and then we are like reading those images, pre-change image, the post-change image, the reference image, right? And uh, yeah, like uh, this is like some transformation applied on the reference image, ignore them. So what one of the important things that we do is that we do a bit of pre-processing on the images to normalize the images, okay? We don't want like, you know, like the images to have like arbitrary range of values. So what we do is uh, uh, instead we, uh, uh, instead we uh, like normalize these images uh, uh, and when normalizing, we also allow it. It doesn't matter a lot, but uh, it's a good practice in general to allow uh, to, saturate some percentile, okay? Some percentile of your image, uh, uh, so which we set it as one. And then this is where the function we are calling for the deep change vector analysis, okay? So what we are getting is a deep change map, normalized deep change map, okay? 
two time feature vectors. So ignore them, but uh, this is the important one for binary chance detection. Uh, uh, okay, and we are calling this T prior CD, this function with our pre change image, our post change image, uh, right? And the output layer number, which is five, if you remember. Now, uh, before going to like this function, particular function, let's go to the networks.py. Okay, so in this networks.py, what we have defined is the model. Okay, so these are the model with the five layers. Okay, which is a very simple model, very, very simple model uh, for hyperspectral image. What's the very uh, important characteristics of this model is that, that according to the number of channels of your image, this adjust your first layer. Okay. And then your second layer, uh, subsequent layers are like very simple, which are uh, moving between the uh, number of feature intermediate layers to number of features intermediate layer. Okay. And in this way, we use five layers. Okay. It's kind of quite simple layers, right? Simple network. Uh, and we are like between these convolutional layers, we are also using ReLU uh, activation function. Uh, if you see that, I will not go into the details uh, uh, today, but if you read the paper, if we, uh, I mean, Practically, what we are doing, we are not learning anything, right? So one could argue that why not just drop this relus, right? Like, what's the purpose of this relus? But what we see is that even if we are not learning anything, even then, if we drop this relus, the performance actually falls and falls by quite a lot, actually. So uh, even if we are not learning anything, these relu layers, they serve a purpose over here. Okay, so this is our very simple model, okay? And what we see is that here, our weights, even if we are not training something, our weights are not random. They are initialized with a weight initialization strategy, which is a chi mean here weight initialization strategy, okay? And uh, you can say that, okay, no, I don't want chi mean here weight initialization strategy. I will do it with something else like Xavier weight initialization. So we'll see that depending on how you initialize the weights, depending on that, also the performance varies. Now go, okay, let's go back here, right? This is where we are obtaining the change information, this deep prior CD, right? So let's check this function itself. Like where is this deep prior CD function? This is in the feature extraction module.py, okay? Uh, so this is the deep prior CD function. And what we are doing here is practically, uh, uh, we are calling again a detect change function, okay? And, uh, depending on like which layer uh, we want to fit, extract the feature from, we will call one of this uh, function model layer five, right? Uh, which is this one I already showed you just now in my networks.py file, right? And what it's practically doing is it just taking the image and uh, due to the large size, it takes some patches from it first, okay? Uh, and uh, you, what you get is like input to net, date one, that is pre-change input, post-change input, from, from which you can, uh, which you can process through the network. And what you get is the uh, features corresponding to image one, features corresponding to image two. Okay, and then you like concatenate them, right? Like I'm not going into those details. Uh, uh, so practically, due to the large size, you cannot pass the entire image at the same time. So you need to break it into the patches. If you could, then it, this whole processing could have been much more simpler. But what you get at the end of the day is like a time vector difference corresponding to the whole entire scene that we are analyzing, right? Time vector difference matrix, which we'll uh, return right now, okay? So before that, okay, we are taking the absolute values and all. Uh, here we are uh, doing a feature selection states uh, Ignore them for now. Uh, however, what we are returning is the detect the change map, which is normalized change map. So this is still not the change detection result. This is a G, okay, uh, which is like a kind of grayscale values between zero to one, right? Uh, which is returned here, as we can see. And then now we can op do a thresholding operation on this, right? We can do a thresholding operation on this. So here we just obtain our threshold using the ATSUS method and uh, the values which are greater than the threshold, they are change pixels, the values which are less than the threshold are unchanged pixels. Uh, then uh, optionally, you can also apply some morphology operations to further refine your change detection result, right? Okay, so just see, let's see like a couple of examples, it will take two, two plus two, four minutes or like something like that. 
Uh, so let's first uh, run this as it is, right? Uh, okay, we run this as it is. And what's the result that we get? Uh, let's wait for a couple of minutes. So it starts with manual 672, okay? And what we are practically seeing is with the hay initialization, uh, uh, manual 672. Let's see what's the result, uh, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Okay, so uh, we'll see the result in a couple of minutes. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's uh, pretty straightforward. So uh, in the meantime, when we are uh, running, if anyone has something to ask or some interesting discussion to make, we can do it uh, right now on the part of the lecture that we have done till now. Okay, so when we're running, okay, if you don't have a question, uh, let me ask you instead a question. Like uh, what I was showing here is uh, uh, you have a pretrain network. Okay, so did we get some question? Uh, ah, yeah, okay, a great question actually. How does the feature extraction obtained from the different layers in the CNM compared with the feature representation latent space learned from autoencoder? So practically, as I told you, that what does a deep change vector analysis method need? It needs a network, okay, which can extract feature. Mm -hmm. It could be one CNN which has been previously trained for something else, like we showed, like for the very high resolution images, what we used is something which was trained on port stem semantic segmentation data set. It could be something which has been trained in a completely unsupervised manner, also, right? Like uh, of, uh, for the in the case of the SAR images, we trained something in a very uh, in a completely unsupervised manner using the GAN, right? Generative adversarial network. In the similar way, we can also use autoencoder. Uh, in one of our work, we actually use autoencoder. However, what we have seen in our experiments is that uh, uh, it depends really depends on the resolution of the image. Like let's say if you are uh, if you are doing something with a uh, uh, coarser resolution like 30 meter per pixel, like let's say some Landsat image or something like that. Uh, going with the autoencoder option is quite good actually. Uh, whereas if we are working with like very high resolution images, like very high resolution optical, very high resolution SAR images, autoencoder uh, uh, gives like uh, quite uh, dissatisfactory result. In that cases, it's much better to rather transfer from a network which has been trained in supervised or something like that fashion on a actual like a large scale data set. So th this is our experience. Uh, okay, so we got our uh, result now, sensitivity is 0 0.877. Let's just uh, copy them. Yes. Yeah, so I'm not running all the three seats. Let's just run one seat for now. Uh, and now let's also try with the Xavier initialization, right? It's uh, everything else same, but uh, just Xavier initialization. Uh, so I have like, I had this function for like the Kaimin He initialization. I have another function similarly defined for the Xavier initialization. Okay, so what I need to do is in this code, just go back, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> We need to simply change one function here. Uh, it's pretty simple. We just simply change this function now to work with the severe initialization. Now let's run it again another couple of minutes. Then we are done with this exercise. We'll move with the 
other part of our list. Yeah, so let's see the result right now. Yeah, so yeah, like uh, uh, Rakini asked a very interesting question. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, like in our experience, if we are working with the coarser resolution, autoencoder uh, can be used uh, in this framework. Uh, however, if we are working with the very high resolution, uh, then it's much preferable that we use uh, uh, we use a network which has been trained on a large scale data set. Uh, Sentinel-2 is somewhere in between, like uh, I will say. Uh, depends on which kind of application you are trying to make with Sentinel-2. If it is more like agricultural or like uh, uh, results where like the changes are like, you know, like doesn't show much spatial complexity, then autoencoder is not a bad option. But if it is something which on which, like let's say an urban data set, like on a data set, autoencoder is not such a good option. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so we got another question. What will be the approach if we have noisy or weak labels? Uh, uh, so what I think you mean is that like, because our approach is completely unsupervised, right? Like uh, the model has been trained on something else. So if the model has been trained on something else, which had noisy or weak label, then it becomes a completely different uh, uh, thing, right? Then it's not a good feature extractor at all. Uh, on the other hand, the other thing that could be is that along with the deep change vector analysis, probably we have some labels, right, uh, for some pixels. So otherwise, deep change vector analysis is a completely unsupervised approach, but maybe like we are analyzing a 4,000 cross 4,000 area and we have some uh, pixels for which we really have the label, change label. So then we can like uh, kind of make a uh, uh, like use deep change vector analysis in conjunction with uh, a semi-supervised approach. Like it could be uh, a graph convolutional network based uh, approach as uh, previously was introduced by Angelica in her lectures. So this kind of approaches can be used if we have like uh, some additional weak labels available uh, for our analyzing. Okay, so uh, we are quite close. I'm pretty like, pure anytime now. We get the result from this and then we move forward with the other part of our lectures, which are also quite interesting. Yeah. So what you see is that uh, even if we are using a like here, untrained network as feature extractor, depending on how we initialize the weights, the result can vary a lot. Like uh, this one, the initialization actually outperforms the Zebian initialization for all the three matrices, right? A sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Uh, so th this is a key message here, like in, for the hyperspectral change detection, first of all, uh, we cannot probably um, uh, like train a model feature extractor model in any way, but if we just take a, like a network which ingest as many number of bands as the hyperspectral image uh, has, uh, and we initialize it somehow, it already gives us better result than the shallow methods. Uh, but still, like depending on how we initialize it, result varies. So this is a very interesting paper I will encourage you to read. And it's also like probably one of the easy to like, you know, like to do further works. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can download the code from here, but also the code is also uh, shared on the uh, GitHub also. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, before moving forward from these change detection things, uh, uh, the change vector analysis thing, one question arises is mm -hmm. that like, what if like in all the uh, uh, cases that I have shown till now, we made an important, very important assumption that they are, the images are co-registered, right? But what happens when co-registration is not practical, mm -hmm. uh, which are relevant for some cases like uh, planetary change detection? So if co-registration is not possible, instead of this pixel level change detection, we can go for patch level decision, right? Like between two patches, we can say, okay, this patch is because there is no perfect co-registration, so we cannot do a pixel level change detection anymore. We can do a patch level change detection that, okay, this patch seems to be changed or this patch doesn't seem to be changed. And this is one approach we uh, proposed specifically in the context of planetary change detection where everything else remains more or less same, but what we do is that we use a global max pooling to summarize the information. Uh, and then we do a comparison. Uh, yeah, so what we saw is that even with a, like a 30 pixels offset, uh, we could uh, uh, predict like, okay, like, okay, this patch is changed and this patch is not changed. So this is one example of this case, uh, meteorite impact uh, captured by a, a lunar camera. Uh, so if you see these two points, they have actually quite a lot uh, pixel offset, but of course it's not so easily uh, like uh, visible with the naked eyes. Okay. Uh, now uh, let's uh, let's take a breath, okay? Let's take a, like a ten seconds breath, and let's remember again what I said that you have a supervised network which was pre-trained, which was trained on some data set, and you want to now use it on another kind of data sets, right? And what I said that we had three options, right? So first one is that okay, just use it as a feature extractor. The second option. What it was that fine tune actually the network with some labels from the target data set. You have this network which has been trained on supervised way on some data set. Now fine tune it for your specific data set. Okay, this was the second choice, right? This is what I'm going to show you in the next uh, three or four minutes. That is fine tuning on the target data set. That is, you have a network which was super trained in supervised way. And then you take it, uh, uh, you freeze some weights and you train some other weights, like some other layers, okay? Maybe you fix these two layers and you don't freeze these next layers and you just, with your available, little available data set, you can retrain these layers, okay? These layers which are shown in like the bluish color, okay? For the tax B. Uh, so this is our second choice, fine tuning of the tar target data set. So this is also something we have uh, done uh, 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 done in the context of the change detection, few short filtering for the change detection. So let's say you had a, like a change, uh, you had a change detection model which was trained for only for like uh, change detection, like okay, like supervised. Okay, now we are talking about supervised change detection model, which was just trained for like soup change detection, like binary change detection. That is not to distinguish between the different kinds of changes. And then uh, uh, you are a company uh, and you have your like customers. One customer comes who says, oh, we are interested in the roadworks. We don't, we are not interested in other kinds of changes. What you do, you quickly go, we you quickly collect few labels corresponding to the roadwork. And then you, you uh, use this, uh, few labeled images corresponding to roadworks to fine tune these models, right? Fine tune these models like here. Uh, yeah, well, sorry, I will rather go to the PPT version. Yeah, so you find, uh, 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 you go back to this model and you fine tune this uh, for the roadwork because the roadwork is the only one kind of change that you are interested in. You are not interested in the other kind of changes and you get an adapted model which only gives you Road work. Similarly, it could be for deforestation, let's say. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here are some examples that we see. Uh, so first example that we see is like corresponding to the removal of the trees. Okay. So as you can see, like these are the trees, right? And the pre, the pre-change image, and these are the trees which has been removed. Uh, so this basically is the corresponding to like uh, remove uh, uh, remove trees, and these are also like different other kind of changes like something related to building. So previously uh, with the full model, we get everything as white. The white means changed pixels here, right? However, after the fine-tuned model, after we use the fine-tuned model, 
what we get is only this the that is only the removed trees here is another example with the for the building demolition so what we see is that if we have some few labeled examples we can fine tune our few layers maybe some last layer or last two layer three layer something like that we can fine tune for our specific task yeah so this is the another type uh, then comes our third type right uh, that uh, you might be thinking about uh, 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 which one of our uh, student today uh, mentioned that is domain adaptation uh, where also we have this supervised model right we have this supervised model and then we have the supervised model which has been trained on some kind of source data set and from the target domain right now what we have is a huge pool of unlabeled data but we have don't have any label so this is what we call unsupervised domain adaptation that is what we do is that we adapt our network with unlabeled training unlabeled target data so this is a huge research area i will say like if you see like in any of the like probably you guys have heard the name of like the conferences like cbpr right computer vision and pattern recognition if you see any of the like the cbpr proceedings i will say like at least 5% of papers are always like related to uns unsupervised domain adaptation uh, so it can be like a one course in itself uh, <laughs> such a huge uh, uh, like research area on supervised domain adaptation i will not go into the much details i will just uh, go like two or three minutes showing a uh, couple of slides from one of my own uh, paper but yeah like uh, there are like a lot of tons of works on this unsupervised domain adaptation uh, and now i'm talking more about like in the context of classification or semantic segmentation not anymore in the context of chance detection right so why unsupervised domain the domain adaptation is like important in the case of remote sensing because we have domain differences right domain differences are like uh, ubiquitous in uh, remote sensing so what, this is one example of like the domain differences of uh, with respect to sensor um where like we can have the domain differences of different degrees like uh, sensor one is played as sensor two is wall view to both are optical right optical of the similar res spatial resolution whereas this second example that i'm showing here optical but of the different spatial resolution mm -hmm. the third one is optical but completely different uh, types and modalities sentinel 2 and sentinel 1 optical and the sar yeah so the example that i will now show you is more with respect to this third case uh, that is two sensors of two different types or modalities yeah uh, so uh, let's redefine the domain adaptation again uh, what is domain adaptation that is we have we are given a source domain uh, ns labeled data samples from the source domain labeled target domain is set of empty samples not labeled right you see this word this labeled word is missing here this is the key information here uh, one important assumption here is that this source and the target domains they share a common label space and our what is aim in the case of the domain adaptation that we somehow use this shows domain label samples and target domain unlabeled samples to train a classifier for the target domain right so in this particular work what we did is that we used this optical images as shows uh, the sar images as target why optical as shows and target is sar because if you are given like i give you like 1000 images optical images 1000 sar images and i tell you uh uh, uh hey abhishek okay one of our student today hey abhishek like uh, you can uh, uh, you can you you please label this 1000 images for me but uh, only uh, uh, okay you, you can choose like either to label the optical images or to choose either the sar images you don't need to do both which one you will do you will do the optical one right like this is like much much easier like they are like pretty much you can see with the naked eyes you know what is this sar images you see with the naked eyes you don't know what's happening you don't want to label it right so this is why optical images are shows target images are sar let's say we have a featured common feature extractor then what we did is that we used a uh what is called in the literature as a student teacher framework uh, which is composed of an mlp classifier and a gnn classifier and this student teacher framework this mlp and the gnn they they in turns provide uh labels to each other uh, using some kind of uncertainty uh, uh, uh thresholding and in this way uh, 
slowly, like both the MLP and the gene and classifier, they are learning uh, a network which is adapted to the target SAR images. Uh, so the, this paper, I'm not sure if the IGERS papers are already out. So this will come out with the IGERS uh, uh, papers. Uh, I encourage you to read it. It's quite interesting. Uh, so this is a GNN-based domain adaptation, but of course uh, there are like uh, tons of other domain adaptation approaches available in the literature. Uh, and this is a very a huge research area on itself. Now, okay, uh, let's take... Uh, Let's take uh, 10 seconds breath again, because we are now moving on to second part. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think uh, uh, taking a bit of breath was important because uh, right now we are going to talk about a bit different approaches, right? So till now, what we said is that we have a model which has been trained in supervised fashion and how to adapt it on our target area or how to use it on our target area. Now we move forward and we say that, no, 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 we don't have anything trained on supervised or anything. We want uh, What we want to do is completely unsupervised way. That is, we have just unlabeled data we want to discover patterns in our unlabeled data, either via some kind of clustering-based approach or some kind of density estimation approach or some kind of dimensionality reduction approach, okay? So these are the keywords, clustering, density estimation, dimensionality reduction. Uh, yeah, so this is a very uh, interesting and this is like a very growing research area in the last three years, I will say, both the unsupervised learning and the self-supervised learning. Uh, so on supervised learning, I will take maybe next 20 minutes, then I will move forward to the self-supervised learning where I will also do some practicals there again. Uh, so unsupervised learning, maybe less than 20 minutes, okay? So let's uh, move forward uh, with this, uh, where we are given only the unlabeled data, okay? And we want to use any of these like clustering or density estimation or dim dimensionality reduction. Uh, uh, yeah, so... Uh, Unsupervised learning refers to the learning with unlabeled data. Deep, uh, th these are the three popular approaches, deep clustering or approximating the distribution in some way. And the uh, best example of the approximating the distribution is a generative adversarial network. And then learning based on the dimensionality reduction and the best approach of this probably in the era of the deep learning is the autoencoder, which uh, one of our uh, student today, uh, Ragini, I guess uh, uh, she mentioned, right? Uh, Autoencoder. Okay, so let's talk a bit, couple of minutes, a few minutes about the deep clustering, right? So, deep clustering, this has like uh, existed a few years now. And, the, uh, and there are like a lot of papers, related papers, similar approach, however, with some differences here and there, okay? But this deep clustering, to the best of my knowledge, uh, 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 the paradigm was first introduced in this paper of Karen et al, deep clustering for unsupervised learning of visual features. And then it has moved forward with so many other related works. However, what is the key idea? In spite of the differences among uh, different works, uh, there are a lot of works which has differences, but the key idea is that we pursue an iterative clustering of the deep features and the, use the cluster assignments as, as pseudo labels to learn the parameter uh, parameter of the mode, okay? So what we're trying to see like, okay, uh, we have this inputs, we have a network, okay? In the same time, we are trying to uh, get a, like a kind of, uh, like from these networks features, we are trying to get a, like a uh, clustering. And then we use this clustering as a kind of pseudo labels here to use it as a like a kind of, label in a kind of supervised fashion, right? And to back propagate and train, okay? So you have like, let's say in the beginning, you have some features, you cluster on it, okay? You get some clusters, you use these clusters as a like kind of label to back propagate. You will say that, okay, how does it work? Like, uh, uh, it sounds like magic, right? How about just think of this, like, okay, you have random weights, okay? like. Well, random or some kind of weight which has been not trained, just initialized in some fashion, right? 
even then if you think of the few inputs okay uh, what are these this quadrant is a series of functions right series of nonlinear functions and if your inputs are similar even if these functions are kind of random even then if your fun inputs are similar similar inputs has good chance to fall in the same cluster right uh, or show like produce similar feature representation here that when you cluster they fall in the similar class same cluster so this is a basic idea like even if you in start from somewhere completely random you are more you have good chance that for the similar inputs you are producing similar feature and then you use these uh, clusters then slowly iteratively to train your network right this is the key idea of the deep clustering so i will talk uh, another couple of minutes uh, on a particular case of deep multi temporal clustering that we performed uh, in the context of remote sensing so what i was saying here like you have the inputs right and you do like a, 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 you should pass it through a network and you do a clustering then you plus use the pseudo labels as well kind of uh, as a kind of labels now think a bit different okay think in the context of remote sensing images uh yeah and think of it as like remote sensing time series images you have uh, t times t images okay so what you can imagine here is that uh, the images if there is no change the images from the like the t images acquired over the t scenes rather i will say t scenes acquired over the same area uh they kind of like uh, produce uh, you have t scenes and they like the, for the same pixel they produce the similar fit, uh, like similar label right so this is basic assumption here you have the x1 x2 xt okay let's say you have a trainable convolution layers which is represented by this w1 w2 wl forget this this is just some notation but what you are getting is a deep feature representation here y n t so y n and t what does it represent t represents a time right and n represents a pixel so for each pixel for each pixel in the input and for each time you obtain a feature representation and now what you can do is that you can assign a label using argmax classification so let's say like in our last layer we have 16 um, kernels uh, so we can assign uh, each pixel to one of these kernels uh, uh, using the argmax classification and then we can obtain loss between this uh, loss using this uh, the same phenomena that i said before that uh, cross entropy loss uh, between this uh, ynt and the cnt the cnt is the labels that we have produced and the ynt is the feature representation right so cnt is corresponding to this clustering here and ynt is corresponding to the feature uh, here that is the one over here is the ynt so between this we can use uh, uh, semantic consistency loss lnt across entropy loss just nothing else but we can also use a temporal consistency loss so what we can do is that uh, this cross entropy loss not only between the ynt produced from the image t and the label from the time t we can also do it from the ynt that is featured from the time t and the label from the time t one why based on the assumption that in the time series uh, there is no rapid change like if there even if there are some changes those changes are very few based on this assumption we can apply this uh, we can also compute a cross entropy loss between feature computed from the image time two and time step two let's say and the label computed from the time step two plus one that is three so what this helps us is to apply a kind of smoothing operation between different time steps right uh yeah uh so using these two losses semantic consistency loss and temporal consistency loss uh, we can iteratively refine our ynt and uh, this uh, means we we are also iteratively refining our cnt right so uh, at the end of some iterations what we get is a semantic segmentation map c1 c2 capital c1 capital c2 capital ct for each of these images x1 x2 xt so this is this approach what we say is the deep multi temporal clustering yeah 
now I, I, okay i will not show any result corresponding to this uh, 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 you can read the paper if you're interested now let's move forward to our second approach with the unsupervised learning that is approximating the distribution somehow and the most known approach for this is generative adversarial network right like uh, which is probably like in the last uh, uh, last five years, uh, one of the most uh, biggest invention like in the field of the computer vision in the last six, seven years, generative adversarial network. And right now its popularity is waning off a bit, but until up to last two years back, uh, this was like probably the most popular approach, uh, generative adversarial network. And I brief, already briefly talked to you about uh, uh, one of the generative adversarial network based approach with the cycle GAN. Uh, before, where like we are using the pair, sudden the optical image, right? So now let's think a bit about in, in more general about like what's generative adversarial network. This is what we'll call is an implicit density estimation approach. So these are like it uh, here over here. I have like a kind of taxonomy of uh, generative models, okay, uh, which I have taken uh, from. Uh, this link uh, to give, acknowledge them. And what we see is that uh, we can do this like in the different kind of like, uh, like uh, we can do like the density estimation in an explicit way, right? Like uh, 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 the additional auto encoder is uh, something which we can say like an explicit density estimation approach. Uh, Whereas we can also do the density estimation in an implicit way. And this our GAN is an implicit density estimation approach. So how does it work? Okay, like uh, I already talk, talked a bit about this before, but let's talk a bit more. How does it work? So uh, we assume that we have one generator and one discriminator at bare minimum, okay? There are the other variation like cycle GAN or something like that, which has more number of generator or more number of discriminator, but bare minimum, one generator, one discriminator. Uh, what does the generator does? Generator tries to mimic a data distribution, okay? Generator is trying to produce a data distribution. And what is this discriminator like, okay? So, trying to do discriminator has the access to the real data and also has the access to the fake data that has been generator, generated by this generator, okay? And the discriminator tries to distinguish between this real data and the fake data that has been generated by the generator. Uh, and these two in each other, like in turn, tries to train each other, okay? So the whole inspiration comes from the game theory uh, objective is to reach something which is called in the game theory as the Nash equilibrium. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, there are like, uh, when you work with the GAN, if what you will see is that one of the important thing uh, over here is that GANs are uh, quite notoriously, quite difficult to train. I mean, this is one of the reason that uh, popularity of GAN is finally waning off. Like what I'm trying to say is that like uh, when you are trying to like say like train a supervised model, what you see the loss functions evolution is pretty like uh, it falls, right? Like it kind of falls uh, uh, like this. And yeah, like it's nice to see and everything. It's nice to interpret. Training of the GAN often is not like that because this generator and discriminator, they are in a game between each other. They are trying to cheat each other, right? And so what we see is like a kind of vibrating kind of loss function often. It's quite like if your design choices are not appropriately done, quite often you fail to uh, train the GAN. Uh, uh, that's the reason in spite of the fact that GAN has given us some of the best papers in the last five years, still its popularity is currently like reducing drastically. Uh, there are many design choices involved uh, with the GAN, like sometimes like, okay, one of the uh, one of the design choices often discussed is like, maybe weaken the discriminator intentionally, because if you have like a very strong discriminator, it will always be able to distinguish between the real data and the fake data. And then the whole, this process of like repeatedly cheating each other fails because discriminator is very strong. It's always wins. 
there is no, it always wins means there is no winner because the training process fails. So one of the mechanism often adopted is that we can the discriminator intentionally. And there are a lot of other like uh, design choices taken. Like sometimes what we do is that uh, we, uh, 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 for some iterations, we will only train the generator and then only train the, iter I mean, uh, I mean, not train the discriminator so much as the, so, so much so as, the generator and there are many other approaches okay so generative adversarial network this is also like a kind of uh, very big topic i will say like uh, to give a proper lecture on this itself needs two or three hours and very interesting topic with a huge number of variations some of the uh, generative adversarial network variations that i have found to be uh, particularly useful in my own research is cycle again cycle consistent generative adversarial network which i previously uh, previously uh, introduced to you. Also, another one is ACGAN, Auxiliary uh, Classifier Generative Adversarial Network. Yeah, there are many other uh, variations, okay? Okay, then, so other, okay, so this is the cycle GAN, right? Uh, which I talked to you before, like we have the two generator, two discriminator, and we can learn from the unlabeled paired data set or even actually unpaired data set, uh, we, we can use the cycle GAN, like, uh, but, uh, capture in the same distribution of data. Now, moving forward to our, uh, in the unsupervised learning, we said that we can take three approaches, right? So one approach is based on the deep clustering. Uh, the second approach is based on the uh, approximating the distribution uh, that is implicit density estimation, that is generative adversarial network. And the third one is learning based on the dimensionality reduction. And the most popular example of this is autoencoder. This is fairly well, uh, well known. Um, I think most of us know it. Uh, so I will uh, skip this autoencoder into this lecture, just not to, you know, like already we are like probably overloading me, you with so much of information. So let's skip autoencoder for today. However, as I said before, uh, to the answer to Ragini that uh, autoencoders are also very, very useful, especially when you are uh, working with something which is not so much specially complex. Autoencoder is pro often sufficient for the remote sensing data, which is like the, uh, if your data is not so much special, you're not so much temporally like complex. Uh, like if there is not so much complexity in one of the dimension, autoencoder is quite good. If there is some complexity which you need to capture, like spatial complexity or temporal complexity or spectral complexity, then often in my experience, autoencoder, it's not so good. Depends also, of course, maybe there are some cases where it's, it's still good. Okay, I will not uh, go with autoencoder much more. Let's go to the next part of our presentation. So what I said that we can have supervised network, we can have unsupervised network, we can also, of course, have semi-supervised, which was introduced by my previous speakers, not touching on semi-supervised, but uh, I was just talking about three of them, right? Supervised, unsupervised. And there is another class, self-supervised, which is also in definition is a kind of unsupervised network, right? So let's move forward this self-supervised learning paradigm right now. What we are trying to do here is self-supervised learning. We are trying to still trying to do a representation learning. And here is a big difference, you see, like uh, when I talk about unsupervised learning, what I say, unsupervised learning is a learning with the unlabeled data. Whereas a self-supervised learning is the representation learning with the unlabeled data. The additional introduction of this word representation is very information. In the self-supervised learning, where our focus is on more is on the representation learning rather than just learning. That is rather than trying to learn only the uh, only to trying to find the patterns in the data or something like that. Our focus is more on the representation learning. One of the very popular approach that is often taken in the case of the self-supervised learning is to learn useful feature representation uh, from unlabeled data through some kind of pretext task. Uh, and how does this self-supervised term came? The self-supervised came terms from its own supervision, right? That is without supervision, without label, but some kind of, in some way, producing its own supervision, which we do here, right? Using the pretext task. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that uh, self-supervised learning is one of the category of unsupervised learning. So for the next half an hour or so, we will 
look have a look at self supervised learning however in that time we will also uh, have like uh, some time to look uh, in some practical examples so they're not to bore you with the slides and I, uh, yeah like i think we will be uh, finishing it by already by 145 or 50 so that we have 10 15 minutes before the next lecture starts okay so let's go more a bit more details on uh, the self supervised learning <laughs> Uh, so, as I said before, the supervised learning to accept the predefined and generally human provided labels, right? Where the humans have like annotated at some point of time. The unsupervised learning is where uh, we have the just the data samples without any kind of supervision. Uh, uh, so, or without any kind of label or correct output, and we are trying to do some kind of clustering, let's say, or some kind of implicit density estimation. Whereas in the case of the self supervised learning, it derives its levels uh, from a kind of co-occurring modality for the given data sample or from a kind of co-occurring part of the data sample itself so what are these like these are a bit of complex uh, phrases right co-occurring part of the data sample itself uh, i will i'll go more details to what i mean co-occurring part of the data sample itself yeah okay so what's the motivation of the self-supervised learning it enables uh, the learning, the representation of the data, but just observation of the, how the different part of the data interact. That is, let's say you have an image, right? Uh, uh, you have an image of a building, okay? Uh, and uh, yeah, like uh, some part of the building is showing you the, like the, maybe the roof, some part is showing you the, let's say the front door. And based on how these parts interact, you can, or learn the representation. It enables to leverage multiple modalities that might be associated with a single data sample. So you have them like this is very specifically important in the case of the remote sensing. We have our data corresponding to a certain geolocation, which uh, probably like we have data using the different sensors like optical sensor, SAR sensor, and we can use each of them as a kind of supervision to each other, right? which will be seen in like the next slides. This is one of the very important uh, uh, aspects in the case of the remote sensing to leverage the multiple modalities or multiple sensors, let's say. And it drops the requirement of the huge amount of the annotated data, okay? So first let's talk about the pretext tasks that are used in the self-supervised learning. Uh, the pretext task, in the self-supervised learning is the kind of like task which is used to learn like a visual representation, right? Like some kind of task that we have made out of the data without any labels, which can give us a, some kind of like fake supervision. So one of the pretext tasks that's used uh, quite a lot in the case of uh, computer vision, classical computer vision is rotation of images. So you have the images, okay. So the one thing that's important to keep in mind is that the most of the computer vision images, they have a, like a sense of correctness. I, I, I forgot the correct word like for this, but it's like a sense of correctness. Like uh, if you look at this image, you say, oh, okay, this is fine. If you look at this image, you you know by default, oh no, this, this image is not fine, right? This orientation cannot be the right orientation. This orientation cannot be the right orientation. Uh, this one cannot be the right orientation. So this gives us the motivation that what you can do is given an image in the computer vision, classical computer vision, you can rotate the image with different angles, zero degree, 90 degree, 270, 180, okay? And you can use these values of rotation as four different classes, okay? So now you pass this image through a network and what you want to predict is that uh, okay, I got back this image with the zero degree rotation. This one, 90 degree provides us another class. 180 degree provides us another class. 270 degree provides us another class. Thinking this way, we can also create more classes, okay? Uh, so the rotation of images is a one of the, I think the most popular critics task in computer vision, classical computer vision, but doesn't work so much in most of the cases in the remote sensing because in the case of the remote sensing images, the way that we see them, of uh, the orthographic view, right? Uh, there, if you just uh, uh, rotate it, 
it, it, it's no difference like if you rotate it like uh, think uh, sorry i should have put some example here but yeah like if you rotate it like a urban area here and rotate it 90 degree no difference like it's still the same like if, if it is shown to a like independent observer they will see no like uh, abnormality in that rotate it 180 degree 270 degree whichever angle there is no abnormality in that so rotation of images is one of the most popular uh, pretext task in the classical computer vision however doesn't work so much in the case of the remote sensing then another pretext task which is also quite popular uh, uh, in the case of the computer vision uh, is uh, relative position of the image patch so what we see here is an uh, image of a tiger right and these two patches has a specific relative position right this one shown in the blue and the red uh, and these two patches then can be used for like predicting like what was the relative position between them it cannot be possible that they have like another relative position because this head and this part of the body they should be in this kind of angle like not in some arbitrary angle this relative position pretext task works sometimes in remote sensing but not always it depends on which kind of resolution and which kind of objects we are training on uh, depending on that like if we have like very high resolution uh, and maybe like uh, we can see already like parts of the building then maybe yeah like parts of the buildings comes in the different patches so maybe we can use it but however in most cases we cannot use it uh, because in most cases uh, what we get is like often like uh, each patch itself in the remote sensing contents and whole object so there is no point of like fragmenting the object one object into multiple patches this becomes quite difficult uh, so relative position of the image patch works doesn't work so so in the case of the remote sensing another pretext task which is also quite related is image jigsaw puzzle so we have this kind of uh, patch we can what we can do is that like we decompose it into nine cross nine sub patches right and then we kind of uh, uh, we kind of like uh, permute it and then we try to get this back so this jigsaw puzzle also doesn't work in remote sensing but something related will work i'm coming to this soon okay something related something from the similar inspiration so the jigsaw puzzle we have this natural order we jumble it we try to get it back right this is the kind of way how it works the image jigsaw puzzle now think of it like in a bit of like this rearranging thing think of it in a bit of different way for the video uh, like this image patch has a like a natural order right this nine patches has a natural order similarly a video has a natural order right if you are given like t frames from a video these t frames have a natural order if you if you put those natural orders like if i show you a video okay of 30 second clips and then i just uh, jumble these clips you will be able to see that there is something abnormal here like these clips doesn't seem normal they are like completely out of the order and your brain human brain will be able to like kind of reconnect like oh no this 30 let's say 30 second and each second one clip oh these 30 clips are like doesn't make sense okay let me put it back our human brain is so well trained it's it can do it very well right so this is where the inspiration comes comes from video pretext tasks for the video how does it work we can shuffle a sequence okay so here what we are seeing is like a sequence for golf probably right and there is a natural order if you disturb this it doesn't make sense and then we can we what we can do is that we can disturb this sequence and then we try to get, we can learn to get this sequence back and this whole phenomenon is called sequence shorting right this whole phenomenon what we see is, is called sequence shorting which is one of the most popular pretext task in the case of the video and this one is also quite useful in the case of our remote sensing how now what we are talking about is a pretext task for video right and what is video is a sequence okay that's what we work with right in the case of the remote sensing we work with the time series right which is also a sequence okay which also has a natural order what we can do is that given a, this kind of natural order z1 to zt to z cap z capital t we can jumble up this sequence okay like this like here we have done the similar fashion we can jumble up this sequence in a random fashion 
and then we can try to get back the original sequence just think of it like uh, four images uh, uh, maybe where it shows like uh, uh, I mean, uh, growing of the crop, okay, like in different phases. This has an order, right? Like in the different phases, we'll show the four, like four stages of the crop. Uh, and if you then jumble it back, it doesn't make sense. Any jumble it, it doesn't make any sense. And then you, what you can do is that you can try learn to reorder it back. And this learning to reordering it back can be done using an LSTM encoder decoder, or it could be like done using any other kind of encoder decoder. Uh, LSTM is not mandatory. Okay, here it's just a design choice. Now, now what's the assumption is that that this has a like a kind of natural order, right? However, whenever a change, abrupt change happens, like let's say flood happens, okay, out of this time sequence, somewhere a flood happens. Times this flood was not something which is normal expected, right? This is an anomaly, quite anomaly. This is something has not never been seen in this Z sequence. Okay, this Z is let's say one sequence, this X is one sequence, which otherwise represents the similar kind of geographic area and everything. But it was in this X somewhere the flood came came up. In this Z, the flood was not expected was not there so the pixels where this flood came up this encoder decoder network will be failed to arrange them back because here there is a kind of anomaly which the network has not seen in z so this can be this zambling up the temporal order and then learning to rearrange back this pretext task can be used to find the this kind of abrupt change in time series. We are not talking about two images. We are talking about T images where T is greater than two, actually much, much greater than two, let's say. So this is one of the pretext tasks which can be used for the time series analysis, uh, which is uh, uh, inspired from the pretext task for video, which in turn is actually inspired from the pretext task for image jigsaw puzzle. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to the much details of the, this work, but you can always read the paper if you're interested. Now, let me uh, move to the more or less list, last part of our methodology, okay? The contrastive self-supervised learning. Uh, here, I will show you some, uh, some code and yeah, like it's kind of like, we are not talking about any more other methods. We, in, for the next 15 minutes or so, we'll be only talking about contrastive cell supervised learning. This contrastive cell supervised learning is probably the most popular cell supervised learning in the last couple of years. Uh, there are like, if you see the literature, there are like every week conference, at least few papers, at least 10 to 20 papers coming up on the contrastive cell supervised learning. It has kind of like outpart from right now the GAN, generative adversarial network or deep clustering, all these other approaches are like now beaten by the contrastive cell supervised learning. What is the idea of the contrastive cell supervised learning? What is the goal? The goal of the contrastive cell supervised learning, representation learning is to learn an embedding space in which similar spheres stay close to each other while the dissimilar ones are far apart. And this contrastive learning can be applied in the both supervised and the unsupervised setting. Okay, so it's not limited only to the unsupervised setting. It can also be applied to the supervised setting if you want, but we will talk more about the unsupervised setting today. Let's talk a bit like here of like different uh, loss functions that are used generally in the contrastive uh, uh, cell supervised learning, contrastive learning. Uh, yeah, so. The contrastive loss first was introduced in 2005 in the context of metric learning. Then there has been modification like triplet loss proposed in 2015. However, what we see is that given and like this phenomenon that uh, we what we want is the similar simple sample, samples. They stay close, dissimilar ones, they are moved far apart, right? So this yi, uh, the, uh, xi and the xj, they are the similar sample, okay? And what we want their feature representation to be similar okay so we are kind of trying to minimize like the l2 loss between them right whereas this xi and x uh this one i think they are like from the diff different one okay so they should have been represented with the uh yeah like when yi is unequal to yj why yi is equal to yj okay the label is same then we, we want them to be similar where, whereas when yi is unequal to yj we want them to be different right uh, uh yeah 
so then we are using a l2 loss with a negative okay so that's that's what we mean that we want to make them dissimilar the same similar thing done in the triplet loss uh, we want so the, here it's represented with x x plus and x minus so what we want is the uh, this difference between the x and the x plus to be as less as possible difference between the x and the x minus to be uh, as more as possible so this one you see is like uh, uh, comes with L2 loss, and this one comes with L2 loss, but with a negative, right? And forget all the other details here. Okay, I'm not going into those details right now. Uh, okay, uh, so this is triplet loss. There has been many other variations. One of the loss variation, which is quite popular recently, is influency loss. So influency loss itself has different variation. If you write, read different paper, the very the one that I'm showing you right now was defined in the paper of the MOCO, one of the most popular self-supervised learning paper. So what it says that uh, for a query Q, okay, we have a set of keys K1, K2, Kn, okay, out of which out of this n keys only one of them is a positive key, okay, K plus that is same as the Q, same uh, label as the Q, right? Whereas the other ones are all kind of negative keys. So we want to uh, minimize the distance between this Q and the K plus, which you see here. So we have put it in the numerator. But as with all the other terms there, we want to maximize the difference. We have put it in them in the de denominator. Yeah, and then we are trying to use a, like a kind of log and then the exponential loss, right? OK, so this is influency loss. It's kind of very popular. I mean, one very important thing to note here is that for this influence loss to work, generally this batch size Kn is assumed to be very large, like at least 256 or even more larger. It doesn't work with like generally with the very small batch size. Okay, so uh, let's do a bit of coding exercise for a few minutes. Uh, uh, so the coding exercise that I'm going to show you right now is taken from this a paper basically chaos is later a new theoretical understanding of the contrastive learning via augmented overlap uh, uh, which is probably this year's uh, i forgot which one maybe new ribs uh, or uh, iclr okay yeah so let's uh, let's go there Before starting with this uh, coding exercise, let's take uh, 30 seconds break so that we are all like uh, have a bit of oxygen. Yeah, okay, so 30 seconds break before proceeding with the coding exercise right now. Okay, yeah, so let's start. Yeah, the, the 30 seconds break was, you know, like uh, important to like uh, get our brain to the right place. So these are like some important, right? And these are like some, again, like said in some seat, which I told is very important, right? But here, what we are trying to do is that we are preparing some data, okay? And we are taking is basically two different classes. Uh, we are making a like a kind of, uh, uh, Okay, when we are going forward, we let's us also run these cells. Uh, yeah, so uh, what we are trying to
what we're trying to get here is two different classes, synthetic data corresponding to two different classes. And then we'll try to learn these two different classes in a kind of self-supervised manner. So let's not go into like how we produce this uh, synthetic data. This is not very important. However, what here we are doing is that we are defining the influency loss, which we just defined right now, right? Uh, the influency loss. Uh, okay, so uh, let's not go into like how this, the it's working inside, okay, but it's just the same that I told you before. Uh, now we are, what we are doing is that we are preparing a very simple network, which is like a linear layer, relu, linear layer, relu, linear layer, softmax, a very simple network uh, to analyze our, this data. Okay, uh, now, now what we define here is an augmentation, right? So, what this augmentation produces is that two different versions of our data, okay? So as I told you, like in the self-supervised learning, what we are trying to do that we are trying to, we have some positive pairs from which we want to make our representation similar. And we have some negative pairs from which we want to make our representation dissimilar, right? But we need to somehow make this positive pair, right? And this positive pair means that uh, it needs to be something different it's not the same data pair like uh, if i take the same patch same image or same data in this case it's not image it's some kind of data if it is the same data as the positive pair then what will you learn because this is same right exactly same there is nothing to learn in the computer vision there are many ways to find this similar uh, same positive pairs one very popular uh, approach is to take like the small patches like let's say there is a tiger's image and we take two small patches from the tiger's image, they are the positive pair to each, each other. They, they are still different patches, they show different things, but they are positive pairs to each other because they are both taken from the tiger's image, tiger's bigger image, right? Or let's say in the remote sensing, what we can do is that we can take an optical image and the side image from the same geolocation, they can act as a kind of similar, they can act as a positive pair, but different, right? It cannot be the case that the optical uh, pair, that optical image that you take from this place and the same optical image again is the positive pair to itself, not possible. The, uh, there needs to be some difference to learn, to, uh, to learn for this representation learning. So this is what we are doing here. We are making augmentation of the data, two different versions, V1 and V2. And for this, what we see is that we are simply adding some noise, right? And for this noise, we are using a function, uh, using a, a scalar multiplication factor called epsilon, EPS, which is very important to understand what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so uh, now this some um, TCS any visualization, okay, not important to understand. But right now, okay, what we do is that, uh, uh, this EPS, you see, is the, what, uh, uh, let me uh, represent a value for this, okay? Let me uh, represent, uh, put a value of small value, okay? Uh, this is 0 0.01, okay? Uh, which is, uh, let's say, not so much of difference, right? Uh, so 0 0.01, which means our both augmentations will be kind of quite similar. The uh, augmentation V1 and V2 will be quite similar, right? With this augmentation, let us train this network, okay? It will take maybe one minute or so, something like that. Let's just wait for this. So if it has not been clear already, uh, let me rephrase it again a bit. What we did, what I did is that this epsilon, this is, uh, this value is basically controlling that how my two different augmentations are different. And as I told you that my augmentation needs to be somewhat different to make a, have a meaningful uh, representation learning. If they are same, we cannot learn anything. 
so right now we set a value which is quite small, but not very small. Like it's not 0. 0.0001, right? Like it's quite small, but it's not very, very small. So we'll see like uh, what the network learns in this way. Yeah, so it learns something and let's make a, what we see is that these are the two different classes in the blue and the red, right? And what we see is that it didn't learn to like, you know, make a proper differentiation between the two different classes because the augmentations, they were not so good enough because of the small value of this uh, uh, epsilon. But now 0 0.01, let's increase it a bit, right? Let's make it 0 0.1, okay? Uh, with the 0 0.1, we will uh, uh, train it again. We train it again with the point one and let's see how our, uh, our representation, the with this augmentation, new augmentation strength, how is uh, the representation learning? Okay, so we are done, okay, with the new, uh, and now we'll plot, but before plotting, what we're expecting that to have a better representation learning right now, because we have increased this augmentation strength, which will make our uh, uh, different augmentations different, uh, V1 and the V2, uh, the two views different, which will allow us to have a better representation learning, right? So let's visualize it, what we have learned, right? And what we see is that we have, this time, we have been able to actually distinguish two different classes properly. Uh, now, if we keep increasing this, if we make it very large, let's say 100 or something like that, this one, we'll see again at some point, this representation will collapse because now, now these two views have become so different that there is no meaning to trying to make them closer, right? Uh, yeah, so th that's what we learned here that our two views, even if the positive views, they need to be somewhat different to make a uh, useful representation uh, learning. Okay, so let's go back again uh, with our lecture. Uh, we'll have another small uh, code explanation quickly. But before that, uh, this is one of the work that we did with this uh, self-supervised learning. So what we did, it was on the multi-sensor optical and the SAR images. Uh, so basically what I already told you that we used optical and the SAR image uh, like uh, locations, uh, patches which are sampled from the same locations as kind of positive pair and patches which are taken from the different location as kind of negative pair, negative or contrastive pair to make a contrastive representation learning. I will not go into the more details of this. Uh, we are already running late with the time and probably you need a few minutes break also before the next lecture, right? So this is a very interesting work on multi-sense sense detection. You can check the paper. This is some result from the same paper. Uh, and this is like one of the first work in this direction. So we see still uh, there are a lot of false color, like a lot of false alarms and all, but the result is much better than the previous uh, result. So one of the most popular contrastive learning approach is bootstrap your own latent, which is not really contrastive learning because there is no negative pair involved. Uh, Uh, someone asks about the code. Yeah, I will share the code later. Okay, so uh, bootstrap your own latent is one of the most popular contrastive learning or not really contrastive learning approach uh, uh, where it uh, gets away with the uh, requirement of the negative pair because you can imagine, right, that having a negative pair is a, like a kind of hard constraint. Like most of the cases, maybe you don't know like which one is negative pair. I mean, just think about this one, right? Like the one that we talked about just before. 
that we use the patches which are not from the same location as the negative pair. But uh, yeah, this here, this B accidentally also we can sample to the same same uh, class, right? Maybe building or something like that. So we are not sure that they are really negative. So this is one hot constraint. Uh, 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 so, uh, 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 so kind of, yeah, like, uh, Uh, so, yeah, so this is the motivation of the uh, boost up your own motent that we don't need any negative samples. Uh, uh, and the training procedure is much simpler than the before or con previous contrastive learning approaches. Uh, so what we do is that generate two views of the images and uh, two different network, online network and the target network. One input is processed to the online network and the other is to the target network. So image view one, image view two. Uh, this is a similar thing that I show, was showing you before in the previous code, the two views. Uh, and we are trying to just make this representation similar. And we have this predictor model, we have this tar target model, and this target model is a kind of, uh, uh, is, a, uh, is an approximation from the predictor model, OK? Uh, so what we can think of it as like, uh, these both networks, so the predictor and the target, they share the architecture, but not the weights. Uh, and uh, this target, uh, the, the weight from the predictor is slowly used to uh, get the weight for the target, okay? Uh, okay, so these are like some results and this boost up your own light and this part outperforms previous uh, self-supervised learning approaches like SimCLR and all. Uh, let's not go into that details, uh, but let's have a look about like how the bootstrap your own latent uh, code looks like uh, for uh, five minutes or so, and then we can close with our. So th this uh, uh, this one, this code that I'm going to show you right now is from this link. Uh, probably I will just uh, share the link with you uh, if you want to habit which was prepared by someone else for another AI summer school, boots up your own written for Cypher 10, but this is a really nice code which you can use for your own purpose also. Uh, so the, again, the same thing, which is very important, as I told you in uh, any kind of deep learning, especially in the self-supervised learning, uh, reproductibility, so we need to set the seats and all. Okay, so then the augmentation, which is a very important thing, and how we are uh, obtaining these augmentations, this is very important, right? Let me make my screen a bit bigger so that you can uh, have a better look. Uh, uh, so what you see here is, uh, uh, no, sorry. Uh, what, what you see here is that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, they are applying uh, augmentation in the, form of horizontal flip. As I told you, this horizontal flip, vertical flip, this kind of augmentation generally doesn't work so much in remote sensing. They are also applying color jitter, okay? So they are just jittering the color. They are applying the image blurring as a kind of augmentation. So this you can apply in the remote sensing. Random grayscale, so randomly grayscale the image. This is also one augmentation. This apply to produce the different views of the images, which is very important to get, right? This is the data loader, okay, forget the data loader. Then what's important is that uh, we have uh, this projection heads, right? Uh, we have this MLP network, we have the projection head. Uh, we, we are trying to, uh, uh, we, are the, we have this loss function where we are uh, basically trying to regress between the two different views. Uh, that is uh, one view here, uh, this prediction view and this target view, we are trying to regress between them in this uh, loss function. Uh, yeah, so then we have a, like a kind of EMA or the, I think it's called exponential momentum uh, encoder or something, uh, uh, don't remember the exact name. What it's doing is that it's taking, it's, uh, it's uh, sorry, uh, it's taking this target as a, uh, as a kind of average of the previous version of this predictor module, okay? So uh, that's what you, would, you can see here that uh, you have this uh, uh, ta uh, 
target as the new the new version as a kind of average of the previous versions uh, uh, of uh, this uh, target. Uh, okay, so the uh, sorry, not target. Uh, we are obtaining the target as an ex a average of the previous versions of the predictor. Okay. Uh, the moving average, exponential moving average. Okay, this is the right term, exponential moving average of the previous versions of the uh, of the predictor. So this is what is been done here in the EMA function. Now comes the actual uh, uh, class corresponding to V by O L. Okay, uh, and uh, in the forward function. What we see is that we can we get two views, uh, like two outputs corresponding to two views, right? Uh, two pro projections, right? Like, let's say if you have two output, uh, you have two inputs, you can get uh, from the both inputs, you can get output from uh, output from predictor and the target from for the input one and output from the predictor and the target for the input two, both of them, right? So uh, one of them we call it as teacher projection. One of them we call the student prediction, right? Student prediction, teacher projection. Bit of different terminology, but what it's basically is uh, predicted and the target output. And student prediction, uh, what's very important here is that student prediction of the one, student prediction one, and the teacher projection two. In between these two of them, we are calculating the loss or vice versa. Between the student prediction of the one input and the teacher projection of the other input. We are calculating the loss. Uh, we could just use the loss underscore one also, but okay, we can also obtain the loss underscore two and make an average, but this is not important. What is important is just loss underscore one is itself self sufficient. So what's important is to understand is that for a given for a given input, we take two different views, right? V1 and V2. And from one view, we take the student prediction. For the another view, we take the teacher projection. And we compute the loss between these two to optimize uh, this by well. One interesting factor about this by well is that it uses something called Lars optimizer, which is a bit different from the other optimizers that we generally use uh, in remote sense, uh, in uh, deep learning remote sensing. So, the, but I will not go into those details of the optimizer right now. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, this is the code for the by well. What's the take care message from here is that we have the different two different views from the two different views. Uh, we have the in, one input from which we obtain the two different views. In the case of remote sensing, it could be two different images also, like optical image and the SAR image or something like that. From one view, we obtain the prediction. From one view, we obtain the target prediction. And between in between these two, we try to regress, which uh, uh, which is the loss function over there. Uh, so this is B Y well, which is probably one of the most uh, uh, most effective uh, self supervised learning mechanism uh, right now. Uh, yeah. So okay. So this is uh, this is what uh, uh, we have from our side today. Uh, we don't have so much time. Uh, we can still take a couple of questions if any of you have any question or otherwise you can always write to me later. I, I will upload some of these materials later in the link and you can write to me an email always uh, to my email ID, uh, my name uh, dot surname at the rate of tomb.de or at the rate of gmail.com. Uh, so time for some question if you have any, otherwise uh, we close this session here. How does the SOTA graph neural networks handle the adversarial samples, misclassified uh, uh, samples? Which types of perturbations are robust? Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the, in the case of the graph neural network, okay, so what I've seen is that uh, uh, yeah, in the case of the graph neural network, uh, it's kind of like still able to uh, 
work with some level of like uh, samples which are misclassified which types of perturbations are robust or what strategy can be uh, uh, used to, to determine the amount of perturbation should this be considered as a hyperparameter uh, so yeah like unless we are trying to do uh, some kind of like uh, really adversarial machine learning uh, i mean we are not put in feeding the uh, this perturbation as a kind of parameter right so yeah i'm uh, i'm not sure like uh, why this question of like uh, putting it as a like hyperparameter comes so what happens in the case of our remote sensing uh, uh, case is that uh, we use graph convolutional network for mostly for the semi supervised learning right and uh, we have few level samples right uh, uh, and and a lot of unlabeled samples. This is the uh, scenario where we use uh, uh, graph neural network. And out of these few labeled samples, mostly the assumption is that that they don't have so much of uh, mislabeling. But there could be some mislabeling for sure. And uh, generally, GNN is uh, still able to uh, work with a few mislabeling. Uh, because what at the end of the day, GNN is doing is uh, like a kind of smoothing right like it's doing a kind of averaging operation repeatedly and if even if like one label is mislabeled out of like 100 labels which are given as labeled and out of the 100 of them five of them are like three or four of them are mislabeled but in the same vicinity so in the feature vicinity there are the other labels which are still labeled uh correctly it, it works fine but if like a lot of labels are uh, mislabeled then yeah it will not work uh, correctly uh but uh, 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 I, I didn't get the essence of the question. Like, are you trying to ask instead? Like, we try to uh, uh, corrupt the labels intentionally, and then we try to see like at which uh, threshold of the corrupted levels the GNN uh, completely breaks down, something like that. Uh, yeah. So th this this is something. This is comes from more from the uh, adversarial machine learning. Yeah. Like, uh, I've not done this. Uh, I cannot say. I don't. I, I don't know if. Uh, Angelica is still here, and if Angelica can say something about this. No, I think Angelica left. Okay, okay. Can yeah. Out offline. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. But this is more like an adversarial machine learning, which in remote sensing we have a couple of works still now, probably one or two papers still now. Uh, uh, not more than that, uh, but this this is of course also a very interesting area. Okay, so if there are no more questions, it was really nice to talk to you guys today. Uh, and if you have any question, then just reach out to us, to any of three of us, and we'll be happy to answer to your questions. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ronnie. So yeah, I think I will leave the uh, call now. Yeah, thank you, Sudipan, and also all the other speakers. This was a lot of material, but um, I found it super interesting. Uh, learned a few more th new things, so this is always nice. Uh, so I hope the audience also enjoyed it. Um, and as Sudiban just said, if you have questions to him or to the other speakers, feel free to to just drop an email, um, either via us. You can also contact us, and we will refer to, uh, you to them, or you can directly write them too. Uh, yeah. So thanks again for for everything. Um, Thank you. It was really nice to to have you here, and hopefully we meet soon again in the future. Um, and with this, uh, I would propose we make like a five minutes break um, because probably all of you are very exhausted after those first four hours, and then we will start with the next session, uh, which is uh, shared by my colleague uh, Ujwal, mm -hmm. and will be given by um, Dr. Shashi Kumar on SAR processing. So let's have uh, at least five minutes and then we, we can come back here and then that also gives the speaker time to join. And then hopefully we are all fresh again. Thank you.